Hello and welcome to my Nutrient Nirvana channel, History, Health and Wellbeing. Today is a show with a difference. Today I'm going to review a book with the author of the book. Um, I'll show you the book here. There we are. One or two of you may recognise that and have read it. So without any further ado, here he comes. Ralph Ellis, Greetings. welcome back to the channel. How are you? Thanks very much, Paul. Yeah, good to be back with you again. It's been a while. I've been away. Yes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. How was the tour? How was because you've been on the uh, the megalithomania tour of Turkey and Egypt this year? Which uh, yes, I went on fantastic. two. I went on Ancient Origins and then straight wow. on to megalithomania. So I did two tours back to back as guest speaker. Wow. Um, so we did. Uh, all of Anatolia, looking at Gobekli Tepe, Edessa, places of that nature, uh, all of the ancient sites in eastern uh, Turkey, modern Turkey, Anatolia. Mm -hmm. And then I went down to Greece and did um, uh, Athens mainly, and then went down to Egypt and we did the Megalithomania tour of Egypt, which did the pyramids, then went down to uh, Luxor, up the Nile, and um, then back up to Giza again. So that was wow. it was quite a lot of work actually. It's it's um it's quite tiring. A lot of early mornings, a lot of traveling, uh, non-stop. Every day is doing something. There's no rest days. So we did see an awful lot uh, and quite a lot of talks as well. So I was giving talks uh, most days. Uh, it was a bit difficult on the. Um, Anatolia tour because we didn't have enough uh, time in the evening. So I was giving uh, impromptu talks on the bus. So while the bus was uh, en route, uh, I was at the front giving three hour talks um, wow. from memory because of course you can, can't really have any notes. <laughs> so that was interesting. So yeah, it was Brilliant. hard work, but uh, very rewarding. So. And I think everybody enjoyed it as well. Brilliant. Look forward to seeing uh, some of the videos when they come out. That mm. should be great. Um, so this book, this was your first book, wasn't it? It was indeed, yes. I believe you wrote this in the, the mid-90s. Am I right in saying yep, that? Yeah, that's right, yeah. yes. It's um, it's a fantastic achievement. For somebody's first book, it's incredible. Um, I would put it up there uh, with John Michel's New View over Atlantis, Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods. It's mm. uh, an absolute masterpiece in the genre. So congratulations. And it, it really does um, offer conclusions to a lot of the questions that we have on the subject as well, which uh, mm. kind of puts it in its own bracket, really. And, uh, and um, I have to say, um, just to promote it slightly, that it's all new material so it's not reworking material that other people have talked about all the time much of it is my own research and my own conclusions which is very different to what other people have spoken about so yeah if people are interested in the subject it gives a new view um, of the megaliths really yes absolutely okay so ralph before we dive in i thought it might be a good idea to tell viewers about the story of trying to get this book published because it turned out to be <laughs> quite, a, quite a saga for you didn't it so perhaps you could uh, tell the story it did yes well without taking too long i've got a video up on my video stream if anyone wants to um uh, see it calling the blackballing of no, that's not on my video stream. That's on the um, Scott Russell, uh, Russell Scott uh, yeah. channel, and it's called Blackballing of Ralph Ellis. But basically, I wrote this book and it was in preprint. So it had been to the editor. It was all ready to go. And uh, then I went to a conference in London and uh, this other author was giving a talk on his book. And half of his book was direct copy from my book, including all of my diagrams and half of my, he, he transcribed 70 pages of my book into his verbatim. 
not even just the same ideas. It was verbatim copying, except you put I, 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 meaning himself <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of myself, mm -hmm. um, all the way through his book. And that was a bit of a problem because uh, he was going to bring out a book. His talk was about his new book, which was coming out sort of next month or in the next two months or something. So I had to get a move on to get copyright on this because I didn't actually have copyright. Mm. So I published the book within a couple of weeks to get copyright on it. Mm. And then I wrote to the author and I wrote to the publisher, which happened to be the largest publisher in the world. We're talking about Random House here. Um, so, a, a, you know, a respected publishing house. Mm. And I said, look, I think plagiarism is afoot because I've had forewarning of this. I think this book you're going to publish is full of plagiarism. And they said, no, no, of course it's not. No, no, no. And uh, so anyway, they published. I got a book the next day, went through it. And of course, all of my material was still in there. And uh, so I wrote to the publisher and said, look, you know, there is plagiarism. I can prove it. You've got to do something with this. But here's me, self-publisher, going up against Random House, the largest publisher in the world, you know, multi-billion uh, dollar company. And I thought this is this is going to be really difficult, you know, um, that they're just going to fob me off or whatever. And I'm going to get nowhere. Anyway, a week later, I got a letter saying uh, the book has been pulped due to your um due to plagiarism from your book and um no sorry before that happened they wrote to me and said look uh, we want to come to an agreement on on this plagiarism we offer you uh five percent of the book five percent of the author's uh income and I said, no, don't want it um, because they weren't going to change it. They weren't going to include me in the book. They were just going to print it as it was because it had already been printed. 50,000 copies they'd already printed. Um, so all of that material was still going to be in the other author's name, not in my name. So they said, well, we'll, we'll give you 10 percent. I said, no. Well, we'll, we'll give you 15 percent then. I said, no, you're going to have to rewrite it. I don't mind you having that material, but you're going to have to rewrite it to say that those sections, those chapters are my chapters. Mm. And they said, well, no, um, uh, we'll give you 25%. <laughs> I said, no, go away. And um, so eventually they wrote and said uh, that the book had been pulped. So they'd actually got rid of it. What I didn't know at the time while all this was going on was there are another 11 authors who had also uh, accused it of plagiarism. Wow. So, I mean, this was the worst book in the world. It really was. It borrowed <laughs> material from, from all of these other authors. Um, and all of these other authors had sort of got together and were trying to stop this book being published. Um, but what they didn't realize, because they were all suddenly glad that the, the book had been pulped, what they didn't realize was it was only my book that made it be uh, pulped. Because it was only my work that had been taken uh, verbatim. Uh, plagiarism is, is a funny thing. Um, you cannot stop someone having the same ideas. You cannot stop someone having the same diagrams and imagery as you have. That is not plagiarism. Uh, you might complain about it, but it's, it's, not, it's not direct plagiarism. Uh, plagiarism is verbatim. Um, verbatim copying from someone's book or someone's song or something of that nature, or verbatim copying of someone's picture. So if someone uses your actual picture and doesn't redraw it, that is obviously plagiarism. And if someone copies your word format, 
word for word, that is obviously plagiarism. Mm. And with the other 11 authors, he had copied their work, but had redrafted it. So it wasn't verbatim. So that was not actually plagiarism. So complain as they might, uh, they were going to get nowhere. That is why the the publisher, Random House, was only negotiating with myself, not with the other 11 authors. Mm. Um, because my plagiarism was verbatim. He had just been so lazy, he had cut and pasted <laughs> whole, whole chapters into his book. Um, and so that was a problem for the publisher. That was real plagiarism. And so they had to pop. Sorry to interrupt you here, Ralph, but surely, I mean, I, I, I can't believe how naive that author must have been to think that mm. he could steal whole chapters out of somebody yes. else's material, put it in his own book and expect nothing, nothing back from it. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, the goal of doing that mm. uh, and also giving a lecture in a, um, uh, in a lecture hall, we had this big conference. This was in central London uh, at, the, at the Masonic Hall um, in London and Queen Street. And so he's giving a lecture of this book, which was all my material, while I was sitting in the back of <laughs> that conference watching him give my book as his talk and still expecting to get away with it, you know, with all his supporters at the front of the room. And there's me going, um, I recognize <laughs> that particular like that. diagram. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, it astounds me how dishonest some people are. I mean, it's complete and utter dishonesty, mm. but done with with such a straight face because he was sitting there talking to all his people. He had all his supporters in the front of this conference, um, talking to the publisher and so on. The publisher was there. Uh, the publish um, the publisher no the 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 agent was there so the agent of of his was at that conference and I was speaking to the agent saying look you know uh, this comes from my book and and he just sat there and said nothing as well um, but uh, anyway it it uh, it got pulped but the problem was that they wanted to get it back on the shelves. So uh, the publisher was very insistent that this would come back on t onto the shelves again. So the problem had not gone away. And I got this letter from the publisher and from the author saying, we will re republish, um, but not with the same name or the same jacket cover. Oh yeah, that's, that's really gonna help, you know. Mm. And then I got in with, um, because before we had managed to get all of this sorted out, uh, I, I got into conversation with the other 11 authors who had been plagiarized or semi-plagiarized, including Robert Boval. And uh, Boval led this campaign uh, with a solicitor, with my solicitor, no less, um, against Random House trying to pressurize them into pulping this book. And then he, or at least not reprinting this book, and then he went off to Random House. He said, I'm going to sort this out. I'm going down there. So he went down there to sort this out. And then the next week, I get this call from Robert Boval um, on a Sunday saying, I've sorted it all out. It's no problem. Um, he's, he's, going to, um, he's going to republish this book not with the same name, not with the same jacket cover, and you will get a publishing deal with Random House to publish your book. So Random House will take me on as a publisher. Marvelous, fantastic, yeah. that sounds good to me. He says, uh, and you get uh, 5,000 pounds up front, you know, as, as a fee, um, but you've got to sign now, today. On the Sunday. Mm. Um, yeah, it's fine. Thanks, Robert. I'll, I'll call Random House in the morning, you know, tomorrow morning on the Monday. Mm. And uh, yeah, if, if this is all legit, we'll, we'll go through with that. No, nope, you've got to sign it now. Oh, yeah. No, no I'm not going to sign something without talking to Random House. Oh, he says, if you don't sign now, you'll never publish anything again in your whole life. 
Oh my God. So yeah, thanks, Robert. Put the phone down. Um, and so I rang, of course, Random House in the morning, and they knew nothing about this deal. Absolutely nothing. So yeah, so that was a problem. And it was quite obvious, I cannot prove this, so this is only my supposition, uh, but Boval had made a deal with this other author to co-author a new book based on the old book that had been, been uh, pulped. Right. Because they had a tour of Egypt was organized with Quest magazine, and they were both on the same tour of Egypt uh, being advertised in Quest magazine. So this big advert came out, new book by Robert Boval, tour of the Nile, come down to Egypt, all this sort of stuff. Well, <clears throat> needless to say, the tour didn't go ahead. <laughs> mm. Book never arrived because the book required the fact that I would sign this piece of paper saying I would not take this guy to court. Mm. And without that uh, assurance, without that signature, they could not go ahead. And so this reincarnation of this book could not be published. And so the whole thing died. The book disappeared, the tours disappeared, the seeming um, agreement between Boval and this author also died with it. Um, and so, yeah, that was my introduction to publishing. Uh, it cost me an arm and a leg, of course. You know, if you've mm. ever been to, um, if you've ever been to court or employed a solicitor, you know how expensive this is. Um, we were going to run out of money because now I was fighting this author and I was fighting uh, Boval as well. So now I had two problems on my hand. Um, and the only way I managed to sort it out is I went to the police. Um, because it turned out that this was flagrant plagiarism, which is a different category. You can have plagiarism and fragrant, flagrant plagiarism. Uh, and that is when the publisher knows there is something wrong with the material and then publishes anyway. And there's two classes of crime, as it were. One mm -hmm. is, is civil only. The other one is... Um, what do you call it when it's a police matter? Um, it's criminal. Yeah. Criminal. So one is civil and the other is criminal. So that meant I could actually involve the police in this, which means it, you know, it, it takes some of the pressure off me because now I get the police to act on my behalf. Um, and, but the police turned around and said, it's, it's nothing to do with us. Mm. Um, because Every law has to be given to an agency when they make the law. So the police said it's got nothing to do with us. Try, um, uh, there's, a, there's a copyright, um, a government copyright uh, service anyway. So I went to them and they said, no, it's got nothing to do with us. Try um, uh, the you know the the general sales what do they call it citizens advice bureau or something yeah, anyway. yeah. Uh, so i went to them and they said well it's got nothing to do with us sorry <laughs> so what had actually occurred here is they had a new law because this had only been out uh, you know a, a few years and they hadn't actually ascribed it to any particular agency to look after this particular law and administer it so then i had to go to parliament so we had to actually go before Parliament <laughs> with with my little book and say, look, you can't have this um, case of a law that cannot be administered. So the case was heard in Parliament and they decided there to give it to the police. So they were given the task of looking after this. So now we go back to the police. Um, and finally, they're working on my behalf. So the police ring up Random House and say we need because they weren't very interested in all of this they really weren't ah mm -hmm. uh, look you know can you give us all the details about this book you know copies of it and all of the uh, correspondence and all that sort of stuff mm. and um apparently <laughs> according to the detective random house said foxtrot oscar 
<laughs> you don't say Foxtrot Oscar to the police. The police. No. <laughs> so they went down there with a, a, a task force and, and raided Random House. <laughs> wow. To get all of the information. Uh, and the long shot of all of that was, of course, any chance of this book coming back out again was completely scuppered. Um, and Random House finally settled with me and paid all of my, you know, court costs and everything else um, mm. and, and paid me a little sum on, on the side as well. So I actually gained some money from it in the end. Oh, happy I, nice. I got compensation from yeah. Random House. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, that was my introduction to the world of <laughs> well, publishing. Thank goodness it didn't put you off and you kept going because we were... What, yeah, we it, it, it rather that. did. It makes you rather mm. suspicious, I suppose, of any um, anyone mm. that's interested in your work, you know. Ralph, can I just ask you, are we talking about an established author that did this or was it somebody... No. Um, this was the strange thing about this it, everything about this was strange i mean mm. this was in the run-up in the 90s when there was great interest in Giza and the esoteric and this was a hot topic hence all of the magazines and the tours mm. um, it really was big in the 1990s and this completely unknown author who had never written a book in his life went to random house and got a hundred and fifty thousand pound advance on a book that hadn't been written yet. Um, bearing in mind that my book was fully written and, and I was trying to tout my book around the publishing houses and being refused by everybody. And he got an advance on a book that hadn't even been written. So the book he wrote, he was now under pressure to write a book uh, because he had this big advance. And so what he was doing was borrowing material from every book that was published or even not published as mine wasn't at that time uh, and that was his way of filling in the material for this book that he required mm. and then he had the ignominy of uh, being one of the only publishers to have the book entirely pulped so random house lost a lot of money on this mm. uh, because they'd actually printed fifty thousand books you can imagine how much that costs mm. um so anyway, he, he disappears into the sunset um, until the Gulf War. <laughs> and then we, we're reading, you know, reviews of books after the Gulf War. And there was this SAS officer who had been in uh, the Gulf, the first Gulf War and written this gung-ho book about his adventures in the Gulf War and it was really a rip-roaring book and um, two days after it was published it was pulped <laughs> among lots of complaints that the guy had never been to Iraq in his life before and wow. he was not a member of the SAS oh so it God. was a complete and utter fiction and guess who the author was Go on. It was the same author. Same guy, yeah. Same guy. <laughs> it was the same guy who had plagiarized my book. He had made this fictitious um, and again had sold it to a big publishing house who had taken it on and published it without actually checking if this guy had ever been in the army before. <laughs> I don't know. That, that sounds extremely suspicious to me. A guy. A guy that's basically a nobody in in book circles gets a hundred and fifty grand advance on his first book, and then yep. does something yep. very similar with a Gulf War book. I mean, that's very odd. Yeah, can you imagine of the sort of character you must be to live a complete fantasy life and sell that fantasy life to a publishing house? Well, on the expectation that you're going to get away with it and and I, I well yeah but i'm also surprised at the naivety of the publishers and which as you said we're talking about random house the biggest publishing company in the world mm. i mean that's that's pretty naive behavior on their part i would have said absolutely that they did no no checking whatsoever um to make mm. sure that this guy was actually writing the material and then they did nothing when they were warned by myself um 
because what I did is is when I had uh, I'd been to this conference and I had an idea that there might be plagiarism afoot, I actually gave them a copy of my book because I published immediately within two weeks, got my copies back. Uh, I highlighted all of the sections in my book that I thought were going to be taken, sent the copy to Random House and said, look, this is my material. Um, this is my uh, copyright. I think this is going to be plagiarized by one of your books. Um, please check. Please do something about it. And of course, they wrote back and said, no, no, there's, there's no problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> so they were being completely dishonest as well um, about this and thinking that they could get away with it, presumably because they were, you know, a mighty publishing house and I was um, sort of nothing. But uh, luckily, they were so so stupid about the way they went about this um, that, no, they couldn't get away with it. So mm. they were scuppered. And um, yeah, they lost a lot of money. I presume yeah. they lost the advance as well. I don't know what happens to advances mm. when the book gets uh, pulped. But uh, mm. there you go. Well, what, uh, what an explosive way to start your uh, writing <laughs> career. I mean, what a story that is. Incredible stuff um okay well let's let's get started then so um i think i'm right in saying that you've initially investigate or your your initial research into this book was at geezer am i right or was it that sure um no the uh, original i suppose was uh, some of the work i'd done at um, stonehenge and avebury okay that alerted me to what was uh you know the possibilities within these megaliths that they might be technical drawings, that they might contain not just mathematical information, but maybe cartogra cartographical information, mm -hmm. that they might be something to do with maps. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started it with all of my Avebury and uh, Stonehenge business, which right. I think we've talked about in the um, in various uh, what was it called? Video. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've had problems with that. It was called dating the, the megaliths or something. That's it? right. It climbed very steeply up to about 565 views in the matter of about three or four days. And then it hasn't, you know, increased since then, which I find very, very strange. Considering yeah. that most of our most of our videos together have accrued about two to three thousand views. Yes. That one just suddenly stopped at about five, six, five and has an increase since. So I very think odd. you ought to get in touch with them. And um, I mean, they're not very good at communicating, but you no, know, write no. to uh, yeah, to uh, YouTube and say, what's happened to this video? Because it's very mm. odd that uh, suddenly nobody's looking at it. Yeah, yeah, we'll do, I will do that. Because I've advertised it on my Facebook site and lots of, lots of people have said, mm. you know, thanks for the information, I'll take a mm. look at it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's very peculiar um okay so i seem to remember at the start of the book it kind of starts with you flying over stonehenge and yes. making, making quite a discovery it was a great start to the book i really enjoyed the first chapter <laughs> so could you um yeah could you elaborate on that at all yeah um i was uh, I, I hired a, a light aircraft and i flew over stonehenge and um uh, i then flew over avebury which is just south of stonehenge and um, at that point, I sort of made an instant discovery, which anyone who's flown over this region might have noticed. So if I can do a bit of a share screen. There we are. Okay, so here we have a image of Stonehenge. This is obviously not, <laughs> not from an aircraft. It's just <laughs> an image of Stonehenge. Because it's very difficult nowadays to get an image without um, loads and loads of tourists on it. So mm. this one is from a um, one of these picture houses. You can buy the pictures because they can get images without people on. But on my flight across the region, I went over the top of Avebury. And this is my image from Avebury taken with my own fair hands, well, fair hand, because the other hand was flying the aircraft. Um, and it happened to be evening. You can see the sun is in the west. We're south of the um, Avebury uh, Henge. And the sun is picking out the Henge very nicely with all of these shadows. And 
I'm at the end of like an axis of this hinge. And it also has like an equator across the middle. And immediately it struck me that I had an idea what this could be trying to tell us because it looks awfully like um, a world. So as we said in the previous uh, video about um, the hinges, what I think it was trying to tell us. So I'm, I'm just going to increase the size of my cursor so I can point out things. My computer is being very slow. So if I increase size of cursor, OK. Um, so now you can probably see my cursor a little bit better. Um, Avebury is leaning to the left of due north by about the same amount as the Earth leans to the left, um, as it were, to the left in its angle of obliquity. They're both about 22.5 degrees. The Earth is currently uh, 20... I'm trying to remember what it is, actually. I think it's 21.4. So it's not as quite as much as this, um, but it's well within the limits of the obliquity of the Earth uh, over the last 40,000 years. The obliquity angle of the Earth has a periodicity of 40,000 years. And that angle is well within the limits of the obliquity of the Earth. And it just struck me that uh, they could be drawing. If you open your mind to all of the possibilities because this is rather esoteric of course you're having to say that you know ancient man uh, had the ability to um, understand the form and shape of the earth but not only that but to measure it and draw Avebury at a specific location with specific latitudes and longitudes on it because these small rings in the middle are longitude markers we'll see that in a minute um, but if you can understand the possibilities, then they could have been drawing an image of the Earth on the plains of Wiltshire. Um, and that was the basis of, of the book, Thoth Architect of the Universe, that all of these megaliths, or most of them, appear to be sort of not only astronomical temples, but also uh, temples dedicated to the form and shape of the earth they were giving terrestrial maps and this is a, a map of the earth and the interesting thing which we didn't really go through um, in the last talk was this um, circle in the north was had a little thing in the middle a cove in the middle that looked awfully like stonehenge um, and the latitude markers uh, denoted by this circle were the latitude of Stonehenge. So it might be marking uh, particular items, pieces of topography on the surface, surface of the Earth. And then the uh, second one was this one, which has 29 stones around the circumference. And you can't really see it here, but there is a... Um, a crescent shaped, a C shape um, in the middle of this. It's described uh, as a horseshoe, circle. isn't it, Ralph? Sorry, say again? It's described as a horseshoe, isn't it? Yeah, it's yes. Um, yes, I think it is. It's a crescent shape in the, in the south. So and with a, a fairly large obelisk in the in the middle of this crescent shape. And so the question was, if, if this is in the northern hemisphere and it's giving the latitude of Stonehenge, then what is the crescent shape in the uh, southern hemisphere? Hmm. Because this is indicating the southern hemisphere of the Earth. And of course, if you look at the Earth, you can't really see anything. There's no, there's no megaliths that I know of down in southern Africa or southern uh, America, um, which could equate to this crescent shape. Um, but then remembering this is in the pre-internet era, 
um, I got a load of maps of the uh, world and I went down to Stamford's, which is the big Mac map shop in the center of London. And I got some maps of the Southern Oceans, which included the, um, do they call it bathysphere? Anyway, the um, surface uh, of the oceans, the uh, the seabed of the oceans. And what I found was was this. Uh, this is obviously from Google Google Maps. Um, and we get um, what might be known as the penis of the south. I don't know. It's very strange. Um, this is um, Argentina here. So this is the tip of Southern America. Uh, this is uh, the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula of Antarctica. And in between the two, a, a piece of tectonic plate has thrust its way between these two, um, the, these two pieces of uh, tectonic material, the, you know, the plate of South America and the plate of Antarctica. And this piece has thrust its way through and charged through and is still charging its way through into the South Atlantic forming this finger uh, on the seabed. And this is, you know, um, tectonic material that's forcing its way across the seabed at great depth. And if we zoom in a little bit, you will see at the end where it's still thrusting its way into the Atlantic plate, there is a chain of islands in a C shape. And if we zoom in a little bit, here they are again, and we get this C shape. And the funny thing about this C shape is that the latitude marker at Avebury is 29 stones. 29 times two is 58. That's how this works. So it's indicating a latitude of 58 south. And this C shape, is on the 58 south. Incredible. Exactly. It runs through here. If we have a little look at um, this topographical map, they're known as the South Sandwich Islands. And here is the 58 parallel south in the Scotia Sea, which is the South Atlantic. And you get this crescent shape formed by this block of material that is forcing its way across the seabed for some strange reason. I've never seen a tectonic plate like this one um, doing its own thing. You know, normally a tectonic plate is a huge great plate, you know, containing Australia or North America or the European plate or the African plate. But this is just a little tiny plate all on its own, doing its own thing, forcing its way um, across the South Atlantic, leaving this very distinctive crescent shape of islands. And that is what I think this crescent shape in this southern um, part of Avebury was trying to tell us. And that's very interesting because what it means is that whoever designed this huge great henge not only knew the form and shape of the earth, with the axis uh, and the equator and the obliquity angle and the latitude of Stonehenge marked by this cove here. They also knew the latitude of the South Sandwich Islands down in the South Atlantic. And you've got to think, well, OK, we're getting quite esoteric here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, how, how is this possible? Well, you have to go into the esoteric to be able to understand that. Um, that is not possible by standard knowledge of Neolithic society. It's just simply not possible. But we know a lot of this is not possible because even the latitude of uh, Avebury itself, it sits on um, a one seventh of the circumference of the earth. I'm just looking quickly for a calculator. Why don't I have a calculator here? Um, 
So if you want to know the latitude of Avebury, it's uh, fairly easy to find. I'm just trying to find a calculator. Have you got a calculator handy there? Um, I might have. Hold on one second. <clears throat> My iPad seems to have reordered. Ah, oh, calculator, here we go. Sorry, Ralph, did you find one? Yeah, I have, yeah. It keeps asking me stupid questions. Do you know how to use this calculator? Yes, I do, just give it to me. Uh, and now it's trying to give me adverts. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, now it's trying to tune me into the adverts as well. Um, what, is it, okay, is so 360, 360 divided by 7 equals 51.428 five seven if you want to go to like five decimal places 51.4286 call it um so that's 360 divided by seven gives that number and that number is the latitude of avebury and it puts the latitude right here on the pub this is the pub in the center of the henge um the red lion mm. and it gives the latitude of stonehenge to the nearest couple of meters and uh it, it's right in the car park of the red lion so quite obviously the red lion was um built first and then they made the um avebury henge around it because <laughs> you've got to have the most important thing at the center <laughs> so anyway it's just an illustration that uh, there's some strange things going on with avebury because um it sits on exactly one seventh of the diameter of the earth which is a bit of a coincidence and so i think there's a lot of strange things going on with um avebury and mm -hmm. no one's really picked up on this you know i've written about this 25 years ago uh more and um no one's really picked up on this that avebury does look like an image of the earth mm. well one i've heard one or two criticisms shall we say Mm -hmm. uh, one of which is that this is a composite site, Avebury. So it, in it what can't... fashion? Well, so it was obviously it was built over um, possibly many centuries. Well, there is no evidence for that. Um, the dating they have for Avebury is, I have to say, utterly ridiculous. Uh, they've dated Avebury by artifacts that they found in the um, in the trench um, and interpreted those uh, artifacts as being the building phase of Avebury. But of course, if you have a temple, and it's quite obvious from many of these sites around Britain, that the temple sites were always kept fairly clear you weren't allowed to have burials in your sacred site because otherwise there would be hundreds and thousands of burials uh, in places like stonehenge uh, and avebury and there are not mm. so if you find a burial it's probably intrusive from an era mm. when uh, this monument was no longer in use mm. same if you find anything in the um, trench that surrounds it this big ditch here. If you find something in that ditch, it probably dates from an era when um, this site was allowed to silt up, which was probably at the end of its usage period, mm. not when it was actually created. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult to date these monuments unless you can find, uh, say, one of these big megaliths. You can see the stones down here. There's some big stones across here. If you could lift one of those stones out, presuming that that stone had never been lifted in its life before, which probably is true for some of these enormous great megaliths around the um, northwest quadrant. If you could lift that stone up and find something 
uh, of organic matter underneath that stone, then yes, you could probably say uh, that was from the building era when it was constructed. But anything else in the ditch or anywhere else is is just intrusive. So you cannot really date these uh, temple sites. Same with Stonehenge. You cannot date it by things you found in the earth um, mm. dotted around Stonehenge. Simply not possible. So I, I think these sites are dated at around 2500 BC. Is that correct? It, it is. But my astronomical dating uh, puts this site back to 26,000 years and possibly 66,000 years. Um, based on the obliquity angle. I mean, this obliquity angle is very specific. And if they could measure the obliquity of the Earth, which obviously they could, if they could measure the latitudes long, uh, latitudes of Stonehenge and the Sandwich Islands and of Avebury itself, then of course they could measure the obliquity angle of the Earth, the axis angle. Um, and if they had encoded that into Avebury itself, then that is a very specific angle which gives a very specific date hmm. because we know the obliquity angle, uh, the cycle that it gives. It's a 40, 41,000 year cycle. And Lascar has calculated the obliquity of the Earth back 26 million years. Mm -hmm. It's a very stable cycle and we know all about it. So if whoever built this site encoded 22.5 degrees into this site, it indicates an age of 26,000 years. Or if you want to go back to previous cycles, uh, 66,000 years. Mm. That's a very long time ago indeed. Um, mm. And nothing like the date that they give for the Neolithic era. Mm. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't be too surprised about this because um, let me have a look at my Facebook site. I'm just wondering how to get an image. So in the book, in the book, Thoth, Ralph, I think, did you, uh, originally date these sites to be about 11,400 years old? Yes, well, BC, that was so based. BC. Yeah, yeah, that was BC. That was based upon uh, the um, the era of Leo, because Giza appears to be pointing at the era of Leo, and so that would give you a date of um, twelve thousand five hundred BC, which I've modified slightly. Uh, because it's sitting not on a due east causeway, but on the uh, second pyramid causeway, which adds 2,000 years to that, which gives 14,500 years ago uh, mm. for the age of Leo. Um, and so the Giza Plateau might be pointing at 14,500 years ago, uh, which is a possibility, but I was down there recently, and if I can just stop this screen share and give you another image. So if I stop sharing and go back in and share a different screen. This was from my tour of Egypt. Now, is that giving an image of uh, stones? Yes, uh, that's the foot of one of the pyramids in uh, Giza. Yeah. So this is a posting I put up on my Facebook site recently because we were down at Giza. Um, this is the second. Uh, um, yeah, this is the second pyramid. Um, and this is the mortuary temple just underneath the pyramid. You can see the pyramid above it. And um, this is the mortuary temple. And this is made, made of huge, great megaliths. But just look at the erosion on these blocks. Over a meter of erosion. And this is not very weak block. I mean, you can scratch it with your fingers and it's pretty tough. It doesn't scratch very easily. I mean, it's not like um, sarsen stone from 
Stonehenge or Avebury. But here, this is wind-blown erosion. This is not water erosion, which would be vertical. This is the wind whistling around this uh, temple site and cutting into the rocks by a meter. Wow. Now, how long does it take to cut into a uh, a stone by a meter of erosion just with there, the wind? Is there any and also, this way? would be only from when this site was abandoned, because originally one would suspect it maybe had a roof on the top. It would be much higher than this. Um, so it would be more protected than, than it is now. So after it was abandoned, we've lost a meter of material just by the wind blowing it. Now, if you look at uh, similar rocks out in the deserts of Arizona or New Mexico or whatever, um, it's generally recognized that, you know, uh, wind erosion of this nature will take tens of thousands of years to erode rocks to this degree. Hmm. Uh, and yet here we see it on the mortuary temple at the second pyramid. Hmm. And so you you have to wonder about the age. Oh, that's a pretty pattern. We've got multiple me's <laughs> and you's. Let's stop sure sharing that, shall we? So um, yeah, stop sharing and we should be back. Um, so there is a question mark over the age did that stop sharing or not yes we're, it's me and you on the screen now usual i seem to have gone black there there we go um there seems to be a, a big question mark over the age of some of these megaliths mm. yep there seems to be a big question mark over the age of some of these pyramids and so if we're looking at a much older date i mm. think that's quite reasonable because again same problem at uh, Giza is is how do you find artifacts to carbon if you want to do carbon dating mm. that are genuinely um, original to the construction era of the pyramid? Mm. Um, not easy to find. They've been trying to find bits of carbon and so on uh, within the uh, mortar being used on these pyramids. I'm not sure whether they fully succeeded in that in mm. getting a, a you know a reliable date yeah i know i know a lot of the um independent researchers uh <clears throat> date the Giza site at about um 12 10,000 bc 12,000 bc around that era but yeah. there was um i yeah. know there was one guy john anthony west i'm pretty sure mm. he he was uh, a supporter of the idea they were at least 40,000 years old Yes, he did mention that. Um, they settled on uh, 12,500 years ago because of the age of Leo. Mm. That's an obvious marker um, with Leo looking at, at itself coming over the horizon um, with the procession of the equinox. But remember that procession is a cycle. Um, in terms of that type of procession, it's 26,000 years. So yes, you can say 12,000 years ago, mm. but then you can also add 26 to that. So you get 28, 38,000 is the previous cycle. And then the previous one to that is another 26,000 years before. So you can keep on going ad infinitum back into the past. That's mm. why I have this secondary date of 66,000 years ago, uh, because that's when the obliquity cycle and the processional cycle match up is 66,000 years ago. That's the only way I can get the same date for Avebury and Stonehenge as well as Giza. Mm. Um, because one is dated with obliquity and the other is dated with procession. Uh, so that's how I come out with 66,000 years ago. Uh, I mean, this is all very speculative, but you know, some of the erosion patterns we're looking at, some of these. Um, megaliths does look as though it comes from a much earlier era mm. yeah, it's definitely. just very difficult to prove that mm. um especially in the face of academia that doesn't want to go beyond 2000 um, you know, <laughs> you know 4500 years ago yeah mm. um so it, it has to remain speculative at present because there is no absolute proof mm. but um there is quite a lot of evidence that sort of backs it up. So it's it's not whistling into the wind. There's quite mm. a lot of evidence. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, as we're on the Giza pyramid mm -hmm. now, um, you uh, you say in your book that the Great Pyramid of Giza um, is uh, very significant with the mathematical constant pi. Yes. Yes. Was was that from your own research, or was that established already? Because it's from what I can tell, it's never talked about by anyone else. No, it's not really talked about, which I find very strange. Now, lots of people have mentioned pi. Mm. Um, none of them have explored it to the extent that I have. So I've taken this many steps further. Um, but if you go into sort of academia, if you look at uh, the complete pyramids by Lerner, which is a very good I, a book, I have to say, if you want to know <clears throat> all of the dimensions and uh, history that the the established history of the pyramids is the best book out there. It's called The Complete Pyramids. Um, but he gives all the data and then never mentions pi, even though the dimensions of the Great Pyramid are the equivalent of pi to like the nearest 10 centimeters. <laughs> we're talking not just approximate, we're, we're talking very exact. So what are we talking about? Well, if I share screen again, um, and come to here. So um, the dimensions, and again, uh, one of the things I hate about pretty much all of the other books, uh, including some of the esoteric books, is they will mention um, Giza uh, in terms of meters or feet, which is ridiculous because that's not the uh, units of measure that the designer used. Uh, the designer used uh, royal cubits, what I called the Thoth cubit. And that's a very specific specific length. We know that because the great, uh, um, the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid is exactly 20 by 10 of these units. Um, so um, we know pretty precisely the length of this cubit. And if you measure the Great Pyramid using cubits, we get 440 across the base and 280 high, which happens to be half of pi. So if we get twice the base length, that is pi. And if we go all the way around uh, the base of the pyramid, it's 2 pi. And 2 pi r, of course, is the formula for a circle. So it's not just based on pi. Um, it's based on the formula for a circle. So the Great Pyramid is a circle, figuratively speaking, symbolically speaking. It's a circle. It's a circle with a square base. So it's a circle squared. You've probably heard the, um, uh, the phrase. This is where it comes from. It comes from the Great Pyramid. Um, and so it's a very specific a multiple of pi. So on the left here, we have a little tiny pyramid, which is based on pi. It's seven units high because they're using the um, uh, fractional equivalent, which is 22 over seven. You've got to, that's not exact pi, but you've got to use a fractional equivalent. Otherwise, you cannot get whole numbers for mm. the base and the height of the pyramid. So you have to use a fraction. And the fraction they've used is 22 over 7. And that is the height of this miniature pyramid. It's 7 high and it's 11 across the base or half of pi. But if you multiply that by 40, you get the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, which is um, 440 and 280. So you just multiply by 40 and you get the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. It's a 40 times multiple of pi. And that's why 40 became so important within biblical texts. Um, so, you know, many people in the biblical stories were, their reign length was 40 or their age was 40 or they were 40 nights or days in the wilderness, all of this sort of mm. stuff. It was a sign of initiation mm. that you understood the metrology of the uh, Great Pyramid. And this explains uh, why the Israelites were 40 years in the desert, in, in the Sinai desert, 
trying to get to to Israel. I mean, it makes no sense in the real world. You would you would die if you were forty years in the Sinai Peninsula. Um, <clears throat> but all it is is a symbolic forty years that says that they understood the um, metrology of the Giza Plateau because the uh, Giza Pyramid is a the Great Pyramid is a forty times multiple of pi. And this gives us a clue as to what they were searching for in the Sinai Peninsula, which was, of course, Mount Sinai. And so the unspoken truth of the Old Testament is that the um, Mount Sinai, the sacred uh, mountain of God, was the Great Pyramid. So they never lost it, of course. Um, I mean, how can you have the Israelites who who write about everything? Uh, let me just knock that off and I will screen share a different screen. By the way, Ralph, what does Sinai mean? Uh, thorny. Thorny. Yeah, to be sharp, um, which it probably is because, I mean, it conforms to everything. So you should get a different image up there now. Yep. Um, this is uh, the second pyramid, of course. This was from my recent tour of the region. Let me just make it a little bit bigger for you. Um, this is the second pyramid. So uh, the, there is a mystery with the Old Testament in that, you know, people like Joseph was the prime minister of Egypt, um, the second most important uh, man in the whole of Egypt. Uh, he was resident in Heliopolis. He was probably a high priest of Heliopolis. And yet nowhere in the Old Testament do they mention the Giza pyramids? Hmm. I mean, this thing was down the road mm -hmm. from Heliopolis. And they never went to the Giza pyramids, you know, for a cup of tea or whatever. <laughs> uh, that's just impossible. And the thing is, I think they did go to the Giza pyramids and they mentioned them quite often in the Old Testament but they call these pyramids Mount Hor, uh, Mount Horeb, and Mount Sinai. And if you look at the descriptions from Mount Sinai, they equate very well with the Great Pyramid. So the Great Pyramid um, is the largest mountain in the region, which it is. It's on the edge of a desert, it's very sharp, uh, and difficult to climb. It had a cave inside it, which it does, uh, which was always open. And it was a mountain of God. Yes, of course it was. And at the bottom of Mount Sinai, there is the uh, a black pavement, a black or dark blue pavement that looked like the night sky. And of course, if you go to the base of this pyramid, the uh, second pyramid, uh, you can't quite see it here, but you'll see the black basalt pavement, which was perfectly smooth when it was made. Mm -hmm. And so the description, oh, sorry, it's not of uh, at the base of this one. It's the base of the um, uh, Great Pyramid. So the description of these pyramids are identical to the descriptions of Mount Sinai, in which case they did not lose the location of their sacred mountain. Uh, they always knew where it was, but it was just too controversial um, to actually mention. And so they forever and a day ever since they've been looking at, you know, the Sinai Peninsula for some sort of craggy mountain that might be the famous mountain of God, when the actual mountain of God was this huge, great man-made structure uh, lying on the Giza Plateau, which was the greatest uh, marvel of the ancient world. 
of course, if if anything was going to be sacred, that was going to be sacred. Hmm. And that is the sacred mountain of the uh, Israelites, uh, which was the Great Pyramid. Um, so there's another revelation for you. <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. So if the Great Pyramid uh, represents a circle squared, what does the second pyramid represent? Oh, that's a three, four, five uh, pyramid. So we go on to Pythagoras here, which confirms again that all of these pyramids were mathematical. So Great Pyramid is pi, formula for a circle. The second pyramid is a, um, a Pythagorean three, four, five triangle. Now the Pythagorean triangles are very specific. They're the only triangles that have whole numbers for all sides. There's only a, a, a very few of them. So you really need to know the formula before you can declare anything to be Pythagorean. And uh, that's fairly tricky. I mean, we, we tend to think that this was invented by Pythagoras, but of course that the designer of these pyramids obviously understood uh, the Pythagorean theorem. And lots of people have said, you know, hold on a minute, that was just by accident. You know, three, four, five, well, anyone could do that sort of by accident. Well, I don't think that's true because um, if we go down to uh, Dashur again, so if we do a quick screen share and hop off down to uh, Dashur, um, this is the Red Pyramid, and the Red Pyramid happens to be a 2021-29 Pythagorean triangle. Now that's a much more difficult one. Three, four, five, I suppose you might say uh, you derived that by accident. Mm. But uh, a 2021-29 Pythagorean uh, that is much more difficult to actually um, arrive at by accident, especially as the sides of the pyramid conform exactly to 20, 21, uh, 29. So the number of uh, cubits are uh, high and along the base. So the pyramid itself is 200 cubits high. Mm -hmm. divide by 10 uh, is um, is 20. Mm -hmm. The base is 420. So the half base is 210. Divide by 10 is 21. So we have 20, 21, 29 measured in cubits divided by 10. So the actual cubit lengths used to design this pyramid conform to the Pythagorean triangle. So that is not by accident, that is by design. And I've not seen that pointed out anywhere, uh, not even in, in any of the esoteric books. They might mention pi uh, for the Great Pyramid, but they never mention this one is a Pythagorean triangle, precisely a Pythagorean triangle within the actual units used itself. And then we have an e even greater conundrum because then we have this pyramid. This is the bent pyramid. And um, again, I took this picture just a couple of weeks ago. And everybody says that this pyramid um, it, it's got two angles, obviously. It's got a steeper angle and then a lesser angle. And everyone says, oh, there was a a design fault with this pyramid. They couldn't make it that steep all the way to the top. So they had to, um, you know, there was cracking or something within the structure. So they had to make it at a lesser angle. No, they didn't. And again, you will not find this in any other uh, book apart from my Thoth book and my, the follow on from that, which was K2 Quest of the Gods. Um, the thing that everybody missed is that the angle, this lesser angle here, is exactly the same as for the red pyramid next door. Hmm. They've used the same angle. Hmm. And not only have they used the same angle, but there is a specific ratio between the two. 
And so if you get the cubit lengths um, of this upper part of this pyramid and you divide um, it's 10 to 5.5. 5. So if you get the lengths of the red pyramid, divide by 10 and multiply by 5.5, 5, you arrive at the size of this little pyramid that's sitting on top of the bent pyramid. Wow. And the cubit lengths, when you measure this in rods, uh, so the rod is 5.5 5 yards, the same as the imperial rod is 5.5. 5, um, sorry, the imperial rod is 5.5 5 yards and the uh, Egyptian rod was 5.5 5 cubits. If you measure this in rods, it again equates to 20, 21, 29. <laughs> it's the same Pythagorean triangle. Mm. And what it means is, this is a miniature copy of the red pyramid that has been dropped on to the top of the bent pyramid in a scale ratio of 10 to 5.5. 5.5 5. 5 being the uh, rod length, the uh, Egyptian rod length. Um, so this was designed in, this is nothing to do with a change in, in angle because of structural problems or, you know, bad design or whatever. Uh, this is purposefully done that we have a little tiny copy of the red pyramid being stuck on the top of the bent pyramid. <laughs> it shows you that this entire megalithic scheme of Giza and Dashur together was all part of one grand design mm. by, you know, from the boards of the same designer. So that's interesting. Um, and what I think these are is, is if people want to go back to that uh, dating the megaliths uh, video, if it's still up, if you can actually see it, mm. um, what I think these pyramids are is these mark the celestial pole and the ecliptic pole. Because everyone has mentioned that the Giza pyramids look like uh, the belt of Orion, but having the belt of Orion is, is meaningless unless you can point to something else on the planisphere, looking at the other stars and constellations in, in the cosmos. Well, if you have Orion, the belt of Orion, and the celestial pole and the ecliptic pole, that will give you a date. And so if, if you're interested in dates, like dating with, you know, Leo look at him looking at his own constellation coming up over the horizon 12,500 years ago. Um, or in my case, I date it to 14,500 years ago. Uh, if you're interested in dates in that fashion, then this will give you a date. So the reason for having the Dashur pyramids is it will now give you a, a processional date because you can measure the angle between the celestial pole and the uh, ecliptic pole, and it'll give you a very precise date to the nearest 72 degrees per degree of angle. Sorry, did I say that wrong? I said that wrong. To the nearest 72 years per degree of angle. So you can measure this angle between Giza and Dashur and have an error of one degree and that error will only give you 72 years of error. So you can date this pretty, pretty accurately to the nearest plus or minus 50 years. You can date this processional date. Um, and the date comes out at 14,500 years ago. Hmm. Exactly the same as the date for um, the Sphinx looking at Leo coming over the horizon when you use the um, second pyramid causeway as the date. Hmm. So this gives us a date of 14,500 years ago. Of course, that is only the first processional cycle. You can go back to the next processional cycle. Um, and so that will give you a date of um, 
30,000, won't it? 14,500 plus 26 uh, is, no, it'll be 40,000 years ago, won't it? Mm -hmm. So uh, the next cycle back is 40,000 years ago. And then the next cycle before that is 66,000 years ago. So you can take your pick, really. It depends. Mm. <laughs> it depends how old you think these. <laughs> mm. these well, judging, judging by that erosion that you uh, showed a few moments ago at the foot of the pyramid, yeah. that erosion was significant, wasn't it? It was huge. It was in incredible. And and the um, these pyramids here have all been repaired. Mm. So if you look closely at these cladding stones, because this pyramid still has the cladding stones on it, all of these cladding stones have been repaired. And there are thousands and thousands of repairs all over this pyramid. And of course, we have no record of when these repairs were made. Mm. Um, Yusef, who's a very good uh, guide, Egyptian guide, who gives some of the esoterica uh, of Egypt, unlike the other guides, he was saying, oh, well, they probably made these repairs when the pyramid was built. I don't think that's true. I think that the repairs were only done when the pyramid had, had suffered uh, significant damage through natural erosion over thousands of years. And then someone came along and repaired it. Hmm. But of course, that would be a huge job. I mean, this is a vast pyramid. You would have to have scaffolding all the way up this pyramid from bottom to top across the whole pyramid with teams of masons going around cutting out all of the um, eroded bits of uh, casing block and putting in repair blocks and that has happened all over the face of this pyramid mm. so the age could be much much older than we think because someone has actually gone around and repaired it all mm. amazing so um the first pyramid the great pyramid uh, represents a circle squared the second pyramid represents <laughs> the Pythagorean triangle principle. Yes. What would the third pyramid represent? The third pyramid I've not deciphered. So there is a conundrum waiting to be um, explained. <clears throat> one of the problems with the third pyramid is it's two pyramids in one yet again, because it has a limestone top and a granite base which is indicative of mountains. This is um, because nobody knows why it has um, granite at the bottom. So the Great Pyramid is all limestone, Tura limestone. So it's all white. The second pyramid is all white, apart from two layers of uh, granite at the bottom. The third pyramid is one third granite and two thirds limestone on the top so why the difference why do we get this different pattern what do you have that is all white when it's bigger and becomes slightly more darker when it gets smaller it's another of these conundrums there are conundrums all over these sites which you have to work out um, so yes the Giza plateau can be seen as a belt of Orion but why not have dual symbolism so what is white when it's bigger? A mountain. The higher a mountain is, the more snow it has on it. Hmm. And so the big mountain will be all snow. Uh, a smaller mountain, slightly further down the mountain range, will have uh, a line of rocks around the bottom of it and snow on the top. And then the little one further down the mountain range will be you know, a third stone and then two thirds snow on the top. I think they're indicative and symbolic of mountains as well as stars. And we'll see maybe a reason for this later mm. that we're looking at a mountain range. Um, and that's why they made them like that. But of course, when you're doing that, talk about symbolism within symbolism, you know, layers of onions and all of that. You can be symbolic of a star, you can be symbolic of a mountain. But now, because you've got two pyramids in one effectively, you can have two different types of mathematics. Mm. So the three, four, five uh, Pythagorean triangle I gave for the second pyramid only works for the limestone portions. It doesn't work for the granite portions underneath. 
So if you want to get whole numbers of mm -hmm. three, four, five uh, from the second pyramid, it only happens for the upper limestone portion, not for the entire pyramid. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, the same is going to be true of the third pyramid. You're going to get a mathematical calculation for the limestone portions and a different calculation for the entire pyramid itself. And I've not fully worked out what on earth that means. Um, so there's another mathematical conundrum that's still waiting for someone to uh, discover what it means. And I'm sure it's significant if, if someone can actually discover what it's all about. Yeah. Um, because all of the other pyramids are mathematical in some function. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so something I've often wondered about the pyramids um, is what do the, the ventilation shafts in the King and Queen's chamber in the Great mm. Pyramid, um, what, do, what do they tell us about the purpose of the Great Pyramid? Well, that is another conundrum again. And again, I'm the only person who has worked this out because I think I have worked it out and none of them have. Um, so if I go to screen share again, and we will share a window, there we go. So here we have um, the internals of the Great Pyramid, and you can see that there are some shafts i think everybody knows that these uh, shafts are in the great pyramid and these are interesting because these small shafts are very very difficult to make in in terms of designing and in terms of actual construction um the rudolf gantenbrink who did the first survey of these uh, shafts said that the presence of these shafts was so difficult to manufacture, that it would double the time it took to make the pyramid. Wow. <clears throat> that is how tricky it is to get a shaft running up through a pyramid because the blocks that make these shafts run parallel to the shaft. And the problem with that is that gravity will take over. And if you're not careful, your line, your train, it's like having a, you know, a train with carriages on the back of it on a sloping rail. You know, if you've got a railway line that is sloping down a hill with all of these railway carriages, what's going to happen? Well, it, the, the whole train, carriages and all, is going to run off down the hill. And that's exactly what these blocks of stone will do. They will all run off down the hill and they'll all end up in the king's chamber or the queen's chamber. And you'll get a pile up of stones <laughs> stuck in the bottom of these chambers. Uh, it's very tricky. So what you've got to do is you've got to somehow tie in with, uh, he calls them circle blocks or keystone blocks. You've got to tie in these parallel blocks with the rest of the pyramid by using these big um, circle stones. Now, he used a different name. Anyway, a huge stone that ties in these uh, these sort of vertical, well, not vertical, um, upward sloping stones into the rest of the pyramid. So it was a very, very difficult construction to make these little shafts. And there is no reason why these shafts should be there. Because they weren't air shafts, because the queen's chamber were never cut through to the outside and they weren't cut through into the queen's chamber itself. Um, they're just shafts with no reason. Mm. And they are another conundrum. So all the time we're talking about conundrums, we've got little, you might call it a quest, you know, uh, what is a pyramid? And then you start looking at the mathematics and you find that these pyramids are mathematical. Uh, then you find that they might look stars, you know, the belt of Orion. Then you might find that they look like mountains, the different colors. Well, the Queen's chamber shafts were another quest. 
because they were never cut through into the chamber itself. Um, and so you had to go on a quest and you had to find them. How do you find them? Well, you, you know that there are shafts in the king's chamber. So you have to think to yourself, well, maybe, maybe there are shafts in the queen's chamber, in which case, if we go along tapping on the wall all the way across, we might hear a different tone. And this was done by um, a 19th century explorer, who I'll remember his name in a minute. And he went along the uh, queen's chamber and he found a different tone when he was tapping it. And so he put in a piece of wire and the piece of wire went on and on and on. And so he had discovered the uh, shafts in the queen's chamber. And uh, so he opened them up and lo and behold, here's a shaft. Someone, you know, the, the quest, the, the task was given and someone rose to the challenge and found, hmm. found these shafts because you cannot understand what the pyramid is doing unless you have all four shafts. You need four of them, not just two. Now, it was proposed by uh, Beauval, uh, and everything he proposed was eventually found to be wrong. So <laughs> mm -hmm. he didn't actually contribute very much to this uh, um, to this exercise at all. What can these shafts be used for? Well, one of the possibilities was a star shaft. And so Robert Beauval said these were star shafts. And if we look at this little diagram, he said that they pointed at the belt of Orion and at Sirius. And then the northern shafts pointed at, well, who knows what, <laughs> because they don't, the northern shafts don't point at any star at all. Mm. Um, if they wanted to part, point at the pole star, that would be very easy to do. You would need a shaft angle um, of 30 degrees, and yet, you know, none of them are 30 degrees. So that's that's a problem for a start. The northern shafts don't point at any one particular um, star, obvious star. And these stars here, pointing at Orion and Sirius, well, it looks all very well on this map. Um, but that's not how it looks in practice, because it's on different dates. So one, I can't remember what dates they are. One might be in November. The other might be in September. So it doesn't happen like it's drawn here at the same time. You have to wait, you know, three months for the next star to come along. And of course, if, if you have these stars go up and down, depending on precession, it's just one of the effects of the precession of the equinox. Um, and so they only arrive at a certain angle at a certain date. And that date is about 4,500 years ago. I can't remember the exact date he came out with. But that's a problem because it conflicts completely with the processional date of Leo, um, the Sphinx looking at Leo coming over the horizon, which is 12,500 years ago, or in my calculation, 14,500 years ago. And so there's a completely different date. And so the answer to this was that the Giza Plateau site was designed in 12,500 uh, years ago. And then they waited 8,000 years before bothering to build the pyramid. Yeah, that doesn't strike me as being <laughs> a very good argument. Um, I don't think that's true whatsoever. And I can prove that's not true whatsoever because these are not star pointers. So Beauval was completely wrong on this. And I can prove they were not star pointers because they are pi pointers. So if we look at these figures on the right hand side here, these are the angles for these particular shafts. So king's shaft, queen's shaft, queen's, sorry, king's south, queen's south, queen's north, king's north. Um, and we get 45 degrees and 39 degrees and 39, well, 
nine and a half, 39 and a half degrees, 32 and a half degrees. And these, these angles are pretty accurate. I mean, th laterally, these, these uh, shafts wind around a little bit. But looking at it in cross section, as we do here, they are pretty accurate and pretty steady um, in the angles that they climb up at. And also, these are very specific angles because if you look here on the pyramid diagram, you will see that despite them all having different angles um, of elevation, the amount they rise is the same in each case. So each shaft rises 70 cubits. So 70 cubits, 70 cubits, 70 cubits. They all rise by the same amount. And of course, 70 cubits is a quarter of the height of the pyramid. The pyramid is 280 cubits high. And so we've got four shafts, each rising 70 cubits. And so if you add them all together, then they give the height of the pyramid, 280 cubits. So it's quite obvious these are not random shafts. They are mathematical shafts because they're directly related to the size of the pyramid themselves, which is a nice check that these are not just simple air shafts, you know, uh, with some sort of practical reason rather than a mathematical reason. These are mathematical shafts. And we know that further if we look to the right with these angles, because the angle difference between these shafts is 5.5 and 7. And 5.5 over 7 is a quarter of pi. So these shafts are a quarter of the height of the pyramid, and the angles they give, the difference in the angles they give, is a quarter of pi. They are mathematical um, shaft angles. And the trouble is with the uh, star shaft pointing is that if you have, oh, no, that's too big. If you have a pi shaft, it cannot point at any particular star in any particular date because its angle is already set by pi. Hmm. And so it cannot point at Orion or Sirius because it's a pi shaft. It's not a star pointing shaft. So the star shaft pointing theory is completely wrong. These are pi pyramid, uh, pi shafts inside a pi pyramid. Hmm. And that gives us a problem because now we don't know what these shafts are for. <clears throat> okay, they're mathematical, but there's a, <laughs> this is a lot of effort to go to to, hmm. to make some sort of mathematical point. You know, hmm. Hmm. Um, It's all very well making the external dimensions based on pi, but why on earth would you want these shafts? Well, I think they play a part in Christopher Dunn's um, Giza, uh, what's it called, power plant <laughs> theory. Yes. Um, I'm not too sure how that works. Well, I, I don't agree with Dunn on this point because he says that these shafts carried liquids in them, which were mm. used for some sort of chemical combination within the king's chamber or the queen's chamber. Well, that's simply not true, because if you look at the shafts, and we now have pictures all the way up these shafts with the little robots that went up there, there's no way in the world that these um, shafts ever carried liquids, because they're just not made well enough. There's gaps in between the stones. And I think the liquid he was trying to use was, was an acid. You can't have an acid in a limestone tube. It's simply not going to work. Um, it will effervesce very quickly. Um, and as I say, there's holes all over these. Um, although the angle they they um, they portray going up um, out of the king's chamber, although the angle is fairly accurate, the actual joins between these uh, blocks is not very accurate. 
So you cannot fill the, these uh, shafts with liquids. You cannot fill them with pressurized gas, as someone else has uh, mentioned. Um, for a start, there is no door on the king's chamber, so you can't pressurize the king's chamber. You cannot pressurize these uh, shafts because um, the gas or the liquid would leak out immediately. Mm. So that's a non-starter. It, it cannot be used as a chemical plant. It's just not possible. And, and the queen's chamber shafts were not even cut through into the queen's chamber. They were blocked off. So, yeah, you can't, that theory just does not work. And so the question is, what on earth would these shafts signify? Well, my idea, based on the fact that I'd already done all of this work on, on Avebury, and okay, it's highly esoteric, and it's it, you, you have to disregard anything to do with uh, Neolithic society in order to see the um, Avebury Earth. But I mean, if you disregard, you know, um, standard Neolithic society, you can see the Avebury Earth very easily. A child of six will say that Avebury looks like the Earth because they're not indoctrinated uh, into the uh, standard explanations for Neolithic society. Or the you know construction and age of these these megaliths. Um, so um, if we sort of open our eyes a little bit to the possibilities, then what on earth could this be portraying? And it took a while for me to see this. Um, I forget what I was doing with this. I think I had a, a an image of this um, uh, pyramid sitting on my wall with a pin through it, and and it turned itself upside down on the wall. And as soon as I turned it upside down, I saw what it was, or what it possibly was. Because again, this is all very esoteric. All I can do is give you the um, give you the symbology, the imagery, and it's up for readers um, and viewers to decide if it's reasonable or not. I mean, because there is no definite proof for any of this. This is all speculation, but it's speculation that in its own way sort of makes sense. So what is this map? If we take this to be a map, what is this map? if we look at the pyramid upside down. Again, it's a, it's a bit of a quest. We've already seen three of the quests. The fourth quest was that these chambers were blocked off and you could not find these chambers. So these chambers were only found 1,200 years ago during the Muslim era by Caliph al-Mamun, uh, who found these upper chambers. Before that time, this, if I go back to the previous, image this upper they call this the ascending passage that goes up to the grand gallery this ascending passage was blocked off had never been found so up until that time all anyone knew about the pyramid was this descending passage going down to this um, cave at the bottom and this descending passage was always open because we have a comment from Strabo who mentions it. And he says a little way up the side of the north uh, flank of the pyramid, there is a descending passage which goes down to the cavern at the bottom. And there is a stone door that you have to lift up in order to go down this passageway. And that's a perfect description of this descending passage um, with this rough cavern at the bottom. So it's quite obvious that Strabo knew nothing about the king's chamber and the queen's chamber because this was all blocked off and concealed completely. So you could not find it. And the reason we think they found it is because outside the pyramid, there is a copy of this descending passage. But it's just there on, on the Giza plateau, this, this passage that goes down, which is exactly the same angle and dimensions 
as the, the descending passage in the pyramid itself. But in the trial passage, they call it, um, we called it a, um, a guide passage because we think that it's trying to guide you. Um, so in the guide passage, there is this separate shaft that comes up from it, which is the ascending passage. Is that is that the trial shaft that you refer to in the book? Yeah, the trial yep. shaft. Yeah. So the trial shaft has this other shaft coming off it, going upwards. Again, it's a quest. All of this um, pyramid um, metrology is all about a test. It's a quest. So, you know, an inquiring mind might say, well, if the trial passage or what we call the guide passage uh, if that has an ascending passage coming off it, well, maybe the Great Pyramid does as well. And so someone obviously went down this descending passage, tap, tap, tapping on the roof until they could find a rock that was a little bit hollow. Hmm. The capstone that was covering this ascending passage. Then they had found the ascending passage. And so they knocked it off and found that there was some plug blocks above it made of granite. Um, and the only way to get into um, this, well, no, the way they got into it was they tunneled around it. So they made a tunnel around the plug blocks and got up into the king's chamber. So this was, again, it was another test um, you know, can you find the king's chamber and the queen's chamber? Because you cannot, you cannot decipher the metrology and the um, uh, cartography of this pyramid unless you find these chambers, and unless you find the uh, shafts that come off these chambers. So, yeah, again, it's just another, another part of the quest, and. I saw what this was when I saw the image of the pyramid upside down. And I don't know if that's obvious to people, but I found that obvious what it was. Bearing in mind that Avebury is the Avebury Earth, therefore we might be looking at cartography. So what on a map will look like that? specifically the king's chamber and the grand gallery well to me that was a map of the continents of the earth with uh is that the king's chamber being africa yeah so that's yeah. africa king's chamber and then we've got the uh, saudi arabia the arabia's down here with the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf either side of the uh, Arabias. And then the rest of this Grand Gallery is Asia. Now, the Grand Gallery has no purpose uh, in any temple or any tomb, even if you believe these to be tombs. It has no purpose whatsoever. This is this vast gallery. I do have a picture of it, actually. So if I stop sharing. and go back to sharing. I had to sneak this picture. Because would you believe uh, we went up into the king's chamber. We had a private tour of the inside of the Great Pyramid, which was very nice. So we, we were the only people there, just our tour, which was uh, 15 people and, and three guides. And so we were in the king's chamber for two hours, would you believe? Um, but I wasn't allowed to take any pictures. <clears throat> Work this one out. Riddle this one for me. You're not allowed to use a camera inside the Great Pyramid. But you can use an iPhone 7. 
So we had all of these people, because I'm the only person that doesn't have a smartphone, you see. We had all these people <laughs> using their iPhone 6 and iPhone 7s, taking pictures left, right, and center. I start using my camera, and he takes it off me. <laughs> Not allowed. You cannot use camera. What, what's the explanation for that? That makes no sense whatsoever. No idea whatsoever. <laughs> it's that just, was. it's called officialdom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and officialdom is always crazy, you know, and mm. even more crazy than most when you go to places like Egypt. But anyway, that aside, I sneaked a picture while he wasn't looking <laughs> of the Grand Gallery. <laughs> so there is the Grand Gallery, um, which leads up to the King's Chamber. And there is no reason in the world that you would need a passageway that big considering all of the other passageways are about one meter by one meter, and I have great difficulty in crawling through them because I'm rather tall. And uh, suddenly it opens up into this vast grand gallery for no reason whatsoever, unless there is a symbolic reason behind it. And I think there is a symbolic reason. And if we um, jump back to what we were talking about before, and do a share screen on that. On the um, map of the world, it would equate to Asia. And so we end up with a, a map of the continents on one side of the earth. Okay, very symbolic, um, but that could be a map of the world considering avebury is a map of the world why not you know why not giza mm. well the way to prove it and i don't know if this is proof or not again people will have to um tell you and tell me they can make comments on this video and say well do you think this is proven um this is the way i saw it to be proven because we have these unexplained what they call relieving chambers above the king's chamber, which have no known function. Uh, they say it's to relieve pressure on the top of the king's chamber, but you could put um, that apex, that roof apex on the top of the king's chamber, and that would do exactly the same function as it does there. Um, there is no reason for having these um, straight lines, these ceiling blocks that run along the top of the king's chamber so we've got the king's chamber down here or up here because it's upside down of course and then we get these little chambers one two three four little chambers and then another little chamber at the top uh, underneath these uh, apex stones at the top and they have no known reason no known function and they were concealed. This is another test. I keep talking about tests and quests, but these were all concealed. You will never understand what the king's chamber is unless you find all of these uh, little chambers above it. And what happened is there was a little, uh, the grand gallery ends about there-ish. I don't know if, can you see the cursor running up and down? Um, at the moment, no, Ralph. Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, anyway, I, I can see it. Uh, it's very small, but I can see something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. I can't make it any bigger than that. It's as big as I can make it. Um, but at the top of the Grand Gallery, there was a little hole in the top of the Grand Gallery. And by extending that hole, it came into the first of the relieving chambers. So again, this is a test. You've got to go and find these things because they're not obvious. And then someone thought, well, if we've got this chamber here, well, maybe if we dig up a little bit, we might find another one. And lo and behold, they did. So they found two. Um, and then, well, that was all. there was nothing in these. They were completely bare. And then Howard Vise came along and his expedition was running short of money. And so he ran up into the next relieving chamber and the one above that. And lo and behold, he found... Um, inscriptions and cartouches which is a bit strange considering none of these other chambers <laughs> had anything in them whatsoever 
uh, and Vise was running short of money, so he needed a um, a a real interesting discovery. And so in the top chamber, he found a cartouche of Khufu, who is the guy who's supposed to have made this pyramid. And of course, there are no inscriptions whatsoever in this pyramid, apart from the one that uh, Vise found. Uh, but he spelt Khufu wrong. So <laughs> I've got no great faith that that was actually written at the didn't time he, of construction. Didn't he write it or spell it with an S at the beginning? Um, well, also, uh, he spelt it because um, the name Khufu is wrong. Uh, this this pharaoh is not called Khufu. He's called mm. Ufu-Ra. Okay. All of the pharaohs of this dynasty are something Ra, Kaf Ra, um, Menkur Ra. They're all Ra. And so to say that the first one is Ku, because the Ku and the Ra glyphs look similar, is totally erroneous. Mm. Um, so the, the Ra glyph is a circle. The Ku uh, glyph is a circle with lines across it and of course if you look at the um, king list down at Abydos the name for Khufu is spelt with the Ra glyph not the Ku glyph and so his name was Ufu Ra and so yeah so his his proper name was was Ufu okay and Vi's spelt this wrong because he spelt it as, as a coup if i remember correctly he spelt it as khufu but of course the king list the original king list it goes back to the time of seti the first um spells it as ufu ra what's what's the king's list of manetho is that the same king's I, list we're talking about well that's from much later that's a thousand years later so that's okay, from... because khufu isn't mentioned on that list is he no no, it doesn't go back into the old. Uh, I think he only goes back as far as the 18th. Um, oh. No, he goes back as far as about the first intermediate period. And I don't think he goes back. I'll have to uh, look it up. I can't remember how far he goes back. Hmm. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. No, I think he must go back to the old kingdom. Um, but yes, I think you're right. He doesn't men mention uh khufu mm. uh, he has different names mm. um, but many of the names he uses are different for the old kingdom certainly nothing like the um, king list uh, of seti the first at abydos so anyway i, I don't think <clears throat> that uh, the inscriptions found by vise are true inscriptions from the uh, building of the pyramid they are suspicious um but anyway we were talking about why this might look like africa and as you can see i've drawn latitude markers and it just so happens that um these ceilings which have nice flat roofs to them for no good reason if they were just structural you wouldn't need a nice flat surface a flat surface means something that is um, significant. These flat surfaces on these extra ceiling beams all match up with lines of latitude. And so the full length of the Great Pyramid, of, uh, of the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid, the full length of it has the same number of lines of latitude as Africa itself including this little triangular bit at the bottom of Africa. Mm. So again, you know, if, if Avebury can use lines of latitude, well, why not Giza as well? Mm. Uh, and so we end up with lines of latitude. So we might end up with an image of the continents of the earth. Obviously in the book, I have uh, a comparison with um, an image of the continents of the earth to go below this and they look very very similar but if that's the case then perhaps the angles we get in these strange air shafts which are not air shafts um, 
indicate latitudes and longitudes. Again, if we can have latitudes in the king's chamber, if we can have latitudes down at Avebury, why not have latitudes and longitudes for um, the shaft angles? And the interesting thing is if we draw shaft angles, Um, on a map. So here's a sample map. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken the prime meridian as being the Giza med meridian. There's no point using the uh, Greenwich meridian, which was only established in the uh, 16th, uh, 17th century. If we use the Giza meridian, uh, we can draw lines of latitude and longitude. And the interesting thing, if we do so, uh, on our map, we end up with a um, a pyramid. <laughs> and that pyramid has the same dimensions as the Great Pyramid itself. Remember the uh, Great Pyramid symbolically as as um, uh, as being symbolic of pi is a seven by eleven pyramid. It's seven units high. It's eleven units across the base symbolically. And if you want the actual size, just multiply by 40, and that will give you the actual size. And this pyramid we've just drawn on our map is seven units high and 11 across the base. So we've drawn the Great Pyramid on a map, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, and so where is this? Where is this uh, Great Pyramid that we've just drawn? Well, if we have a look on a map, it's actually up in the high Himalaya. So it's in the most inaccessible part of the world you could possibly imagine. And so we end up with this, this great um, triangle stuck across... Um, the whole of the Himalaya almost. And it just so happens that the center, it doesn't look like the center here, but um, if you actually measure it, that is the center between the top and the bottom. I think this is a bit of a, um, not a parallax issue, it's, it's a, a brain teaser it doesn't because it's a triangle it doesn't look like the center but anyway that is the center of the triangle and that happens to be k2 the mountain k2 mm -hmm. is right at the center of that triangle which was drawn by the shaft angles the lines of latitude and longitude from the shaft angles and well that was sort of interesting but this was pre-internet era i mean how do you find out anything about that region so i went down to stanford's again supposed to be the biggest map shop in the whole of the world and they didn't have anything <laughs> <laughs> the only maps i had were about this sort of size it just showed you the whole region and you go oh well that's no that's no good um, I want some more detail here, please. Um, and I couldn't find it. So finally, Stanford said, well, K2's in China. Maybe they've got a map. As it happens, they were slightly wrong on that because um, the border between Pakistan and China goes right through the top of K2. Oh, wow. Well. So it's, yeah, it's on, it's on the borders of both countries. Mm. Um, so, so I wrote to China um with a letter a surface letter so you can imagine this took a long time mm. and i got a reply and they said yes we've got a map please send 25 dollars or whatever it was and of course you couldn't do a bank transfer so i had to just uh, stick 25 dollars in a, in a letter and send it back to them and uh, lo and behold i got a map and it was a very detailed map as well and it was a very interesting map because what I found is that this bit here, K2, which was at the center of this pyramid, which had been um, 
created by the Great Pyramid coordinates, there was a pyramid. And there was a pyramid that looks exactly like the Great Pyramid. And here it is. Wow. And that was a little bit sort of shocking. <clears throat> Because what do we have here? I mean, this is orientated in the correct sense. Um, so this is um, north, south, east, west. So we have a square pyramid. This is K2 itself. This is the mountain of K2. And K2 is a square pyramid. You can see all the ridges, northwest ridge, northeast ridge, southeast ridge, southwest ridge. It's orientated with the cardinal points exactly the same as the Great Pyramid is. Um, so it has a square base. It's a pyramid. It's aligned with the cardinal points. It's pure white because it's high enough that it's always above the snow line. So it's always pure white, just as the Great Pyramid was always pure white. And then at the bottom of it, you can see a causeway coming out of the bottom mm. at 14 degrees to K2. And the Great Pyramid has a causeway that comes out of the bottom at 14 degrees to the base of the pyramid. That's incredible. It's odd, isn't it? It's odd. Especially odd considering the way I found this. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't searching around a map. It's, it's not as if we had Google Earth um, mm. and I was searching around for Google Earth for anything that looked like a pyramid because there was no Google Earth. There was no internet <laughs> when, when I wrote this book. Um, <clears throat> so this was only found because the Great Pyramid had shaft angles, which indicated I should go and look at K2 because it drew a pyramid in the Himalaya and the center of that pyramid, that map pyramid, was the mountain K2. And then I got um, detailed maps of the region from China. So all of this took like five months to get these mm. maps back. I and mean, this was not a fast process. Mm. So I went looking for maps, found a map, opened the map up, and lo and behold, I get an image of the very pyramid that sent me in that direction in the first place. Odd, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's incredible. Very odd. Yeah. Um, and then you've got to ask yourself, is this pure coincidence? Is, is this? I think with the causeway, with the causeway on top of everything else, I think it's just <laughs> a bit too hard to, you know, call it a coincidence. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I haven't read K2 yet, but uh, <laughs> I certainly will be in the very near future. Uh, yeah. So I, don't, it... I don't know how far you want to go into this particular part of the story. Because well, we could do a separate video. I mean, this, des <laughs> this deserves a separate video. <laughs> You know, this is pretty yeah. amazing stuff. Um, unfortunately, there's not much more can be said about this because there is no conclusion to this story. Because what can we say about this? You know, what further is there to say about this similarity? It's not the uh, easiest part of the world to explore e either, is it? K2 is the hardest mountain to climb. Yes, the it's the hardest mountain to even get to because, mm. I mean, even to walk there, it took me two weeks of walking to get there. So it, it, it took f uh, five days by car uh, to get to the nearest town, well, village, uh, which was interesting in itself because it was a, it was a village of, of um, uh, midgets. I kid you not, the, the, the tallest person in this village was like four foot tall. Wow. 
and there's me and my guide my my sirdar i think they call him the sirdar guide he was bit, he was pakistani so I, I came at this from pakistan not from china because this lies mm -hmm. on the borders um in fact i think you can see the border is that red line running from the northwest down to the southeast i no that's that might be the border with china i'm not sure if we ever strayed into china itself um but anyway we we came at this um up this glacier here at the bottom to concordia this is known as concordia um <clears throat> oh it's just off the bottom of the map anyway there's a, a glacier runs up from the bottom of the map to the bottom of this glacier here and that's known as concordia and all of that is in pakistan and then you can walk up this uh glacier here to the base of k2 but then all of the north is in china so you can't really get to the um, north side of k2 um <clears throat> So yes, it's in a very inaccessible position. Position. It takes five days by car to get up to Skard, which is the nearest big town. Then we had a day's driving to get to this little tiny village with all of the um, people that were um, only four foot high. So we looked like men. There was uh, us two, me and my guide, walking through this. And it looked like a, a sea of children around us. It started to but sound like they... a scene out of Star Wars or something, Ralph. This is incredible. Did, yes. I imagine it if you get up on, you would have been a bit like Chewbacca compared to the rest of the <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, especially my Serda guide, because he was quite heavy. <clears throat> he was Chewbacca. Um, <laughs> so we, we bought two, um, two goats. And of course, because they were miniature people, they were miniature goats. I mean, they wouldn't be much bigger than a cat, these things, you know. <laughs> Well, maybe a little bit bigger, a small dog. So they were miniature goats. So uh, we, we named those goats lunch and dinner. <laughs> and um, they walked all the way up to the top with, with us. Wow. Which was very nice, but they didn't walk down. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, very inaccessible place to get to. So if you wanted, and here is complete speculation. Uh, if you wanted to hold secrets, yeah. there is no better place mm. on the surface of the earth than than K2, <clears throat> because it's the most inaccessible place in the world, pretty much. Mm. And there is also sort of vague Greek tales which coincide with this. So we have the story of Bacchus going up into the high Himalaya um, with his um, attendants, cutting mountains in half and slicing mountains using wands of ivy. And they were slicing mountains open. And you've got to wonder what on earth is that story all about? Why on earth was Bacchus up in the um, high Himalaya cutting rocks and having battles with, with uh, was it Amazons? I forget. Anyway, he was having battles with someone up in the Himalaya. <clears throat> Very odd story. Um, and then we have the history of Alexander. Hmm. Alexander the Great, who defeated Darius the Third, he became Pharaoh of Egypt, of course. So he was initiated into the mysteries of Egypt. He then adopted the um, horns of a ram. So he knew about the great month of Aries because he was a king of Aries. And then he went across into uh, Persia, defeated Darius. Uh, because he defeated Darius on two or three occasions. He defeated him again at Persopolis, which is over on the um, left side of this map. And then he continued, and he continued right up into Afghanistan. So he went up through Pakistan, up, up through Afghanistan, and he ended up here in the 
top left corner here where this red dot is, which is one of the coordinates given by the Great Pyramid. And he ended up here, up in the uh, up in the Karakoram. Um, and you've got to wonder what on earth was he doing up here in the high Himalaya? Was he really still looking for Darius the Third, putting his troops because he had like thirty thousand troops or something, putting them through all the trials of this barren land of Afghanistan? You've probably all seen images of Afghanistan being a, just a dusty wasteland. Mm. Um, and then he turned south because he couldn't find anything there. And what was he looking for? Everywhere he went, he was looking for sacred mountains. And he was investigating mountains. Um, he even went uh, up to Skardu. Uh, that's probably why uh, Skardu is called Skardu. Uh, which was the nearest town when we started this expedition. It's called Skardu after Iskander, which is the name for Alexander the Great. And here's Skardu, here. So he sent some people up to Skardu, which is, you know, where I went. That was the beginning. That's where you start walking, yeah. uh, is from Skardu. And you go up this uh, glacier here. Um, that is, Skardu is a very, very difficult place to get to. There's a little high valley up there, but it, um, it took us two days and 1,000 hairpin bends to get from Islamabad up to Skardu. It was the most crazy, um, uh, crazy road in the whole world going up there. <laughs> two days it took. Yeah. Um, but on the way down, I took an aeroplane and it took 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine taking people up to Skardu. <clears throat> and that's only with the, the Chinese road. Uh, so Pakistan uh, paid the Chinese to make this road up to Skardu. Prior to that, it was only donkey and, well, not even donkey and cart. You couldn't even run a cart up there. It was donkey and backpack mm. was the only way to get to Skardu. And yet somehow Alexander the Great, he didn't take his whole army up there, but he, he had sent an advance guard uh, up to Skardu, up this impenetrable uh, valley to try and get up to Skardu. Mm. What on earth was he doing up there? Uh, I don't have um, an image. Do I have an image? Let me uh, quickly, because it's worth having a look. Um, I'm so, just, uh, yeah, yeah. While you're... So my get my guess was all I know. I know what I th what I think he was looking for, but I don't want to jump in and spoil the story. <laughs> So, but I, I've got an idea what he was looking for. Well, go, go ahead, speculate away. Well, okay. So I, I would imagine that he was looking for the Hall of Records. Yes. Well, that was um, on the lips of everybody uh, back in the 1990s. Hmm. Um, but of course, based upon what evidence, you know, there was very little evidence that there should be anything like that. Um, I mean, what's your, what's your take on what the Hall of Records should be? Um, it's basically a, 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 a huge library or uh, records of our ancient past. And uh, they, it would possibly tell us uh, how certain megalithic structures were built the the techniques and the technology that were used to to construct these amazing structures mm. and probably a lot of other stuff as well <laughs> and 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 what evidence might there be for that what do you mean sorry well where does this information come from where does 
Um, uh, well, whoever, I mean, who told Alexander the Great to, to go? Well, who, who sort of uh, suggested that idea to Alexander the Great? Was it a mystery school in Egypt or? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all it could really be because we don't have uh, any information that would... that would say anything about that. Um, you, you see, I've never really found any information. Lots of people keep talking about this uh, legendary place, but I've not really found uh, much information that would give you any evidence for it. Okay. Um, the only thing I've found um, was, I'm still looking for things here. Mm -hmm. um, The only thing I found uh, was a comment by Josephus Flavius that at the beginning of time, there were two pillars made. And of course, they, the word they tend to use is, is Matsiba, and a, a, a mastaber in, in Egyptian uh, refers to a pyramid. But anyway, he calls that's, them. That's like an old school pyramid, like a, a pyramid before the pyramids were around. Is that right? Like a, yeah. a long barrow? As a step pyramid, yeah. Right. Um, and so upon these two pillars, the, you know, as you were saying, the information of the world was stored. Um, and the, there was one made of, um, one made of stone and one made of brick. Um, the one made of stone in case the other one would be taken away by floods and the one made of uh, brick in case the other one would be taken away uh, by fire. So Josephus Flavius does mention what could be considered to be a repository uh, of information. Um, and so that is that is a possibility. Um, I was just going to jump across. Let's, I think I, I, while you're doing that, I think I told you a while ago, there's been rumours for quite a while on the internet about supposedly a hall of records that may have been discovered in a mountainous part of uh, Romania, where there is um, something that strongly resembles a sphinx. Um, mm. I think the official word is, is that it's naturally occurring, this, this thing that looks very much like a sphinx to me. And uh, there's long been rumours that the uh, American army went in there and discovered all sorts of stuff. But of course, mm. that, that's the internet. You know, it's it could well be a load of old tosh, who knows. But... <clears throat> the, the thing about uh, discoveries like that is they are discoveries with people, you know, searching on Google Earth. If, if you search the Earth, no doubt you'll find funny shapes of topography, which might, you know, suggest that they are artificial or whatever. Um, that is not a, a very conclusive way of finding something. Finding K2 is another matter, as I've already said, that this was um, found via the coordinates inside the Great Pyramid. And so that's a much more secure way, as it were. I mean, it's still highly esoteric. All I can do is give the information. Um, I can't tell anyone if this is correct or not because well, we simply don't know. So it's it's really what you make of it. Um, so all I can do is present the information and readers can make up their own mind. You know, I really have no, <clears throat> no worry about what people are thinking. No, at the end of the day, Ralph, you're very much an evidence-based guy, aren't you? So yeah, yeah, exactly. Very much so. Hmm. So this was um, this is all I could get at the time. So this was a space shuttle, I think. Yeah, this this came from a space shuttle, and someone took a uh, a picture out of the window of the space shuttle. <laughs> and I bought this from NASA. Cost me an arm and a leg back in 1995. Um, and this was the valley we walked up. So again, bottom left corner. There's a valley runs up here. And uh, when you get about a third of the way up, it changes color a little bit. That's when it turns into a glacier. And now you've got to walk on the glacier 
uh, all the way up to the um, top. And then you walk all the way up to this join, this sort of T-shape here. Um, that's Concordia. And then you turn left and head up this glacier. And that is K2 there. And you cannot really see what it looks like there um, because it's... Uh, it's whited out, really. You can't see. There's not enough detail on that. But this is the trail you have to take. So this is the path um, up the valley to K2. Um, this is the glacier down below on the right side, in the mid-right side. That's the glacier. Now, I know it doesn't look like a glacier, but glaciers are not white and icy. <laughs> They are, they're covered in rocks. Mm -hmm. And this one is just a minefield. And it's a minefield with lots of um, um, fissures in it, which are very dangerous because you might suddenly disappear down by 500 foot. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the walk on the glacier was actually up on the hive um, mountain side. And this was the path up the valley. And the path is about a foot and a half wide. Wow. <laughs> and down to the right is a thousand foot drop. So you've got to be fairly sure in your footing when you go up here. <laughs> Steady as you go, yeah. <laughs> it's a long way down if you make a slip. So that's the high trail that goes up to... K2. So it's a bit of a trek, you can imagine. Um, and then you turn the corner, and that's what you see. Yeah. And there's K2. And as you can see, it's a, it's a pyramidal um, mountain. Um, and that at the bottom is the glacier again. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. There you go. Um, and then that is myself ah, back in the standing, day. standing on the glacier. So that is a glacier. That's what a glacier looks like. So it's like a hundred percent rock. <clears throat> Actually, Ralph, I, can, I can appreciate your height now. You are a tall chap, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> High as K2. Yeah. <laughs> and there is K2 in the background. And as you can see, it's a pyramidal uh, mountain aligned with the cardinal points. Yep. Um, and that is the glacier below. So beneath me, there's a, another thousand foot of ice underneath there somewhere. But of course, all of the rocks land on the top. Uh, and then the ice ablates on the surface and it just leaves the rocks there. And uh, so you get a pile of rocks. So it's very, very difficult going. Oh, that's me on the rock at Balbec. It's the, uh, Just for no good there. reason. That's that's the big <laughs> stone at Balbec with me standing on the stone. I think if you type in um, the preg, is it the pregnant uh, mother stone? Yeah, the pregnant stone of the pregnant woman. Yeah. Stone of the pregnant woman. If you type that into Google Images, that's the picture that comes up. I'm pretty sure of it. <laughs> it is, yes. Yeah, yeah you because I was, yeah. One of, I was one of the first to, to go there. Um, mm. Alan Alford, I think, that went there first out of the um, alternate authors. And uh, I think he's deceased now, Alan Alford. Yeah, I think he is. And um, I was one of the early ones. This was back in 2007 or something like that, 2006. Um, so, yeah, that's just some extra pictures. And then we come down to the, the Giza pyramid again. and. Um, that's K2. So uh, I shall unscreen that. <clears throat> and we're back again. Here we are. Wow, fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Um, have, we covered yeah. have, we, have we covered I, everything now? Oh, well, no, there's a lot of extra explanation within the books, of course. You can only cover so much in, in a two-hour talk. Um, oh. So there's a lot of other detail. There's a lot of other references. There's, there's more mathematics, which shows you where this came from. Um, 
and a lot of other explanations as well. So it's well worth having a look at, uh, at the books. But that gives you a good idea of what the books are about. So mm. it's novel material. It's not contained in any other books uh, that have been written on this topic. Mm -hmm. um, it's all backed up with the actual dimensions and imagery of the megaliths themselves. So it all makes sense from the original megaliths. The only thing is, is it's slightly left of field, you might say. It's mm. esoteric. Um, it's an explanation that only makes sense if you're happy um, to imagine the megalithic era as being very ancient and megalithic man having much more knowledge and much more technical capabilities than they are given credence for. Now you can see that in any fashion you, you want. If you go down the sort of Graham Hancock route, uh, then you, you have a previous technical civilization that he talks about quite a lot, which is possible, but I still think that we would have evidence for that previous technical uh, civilization if one existed. There would be a technical layer within the stratigraphy of, of you know, um, all of the ancient sites that we actually um, uh, know of. As we dig down, you would find technical artifacts and they're not really visible. All we have is um, megaliths. Um, then you have the sort of von Daniken route, which is, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's not aliens, but it was all aliens. Um, so you have that possibility uh, of intervention by um, a extraterrestrial um, society, which is possible. <clears throat> I mean, if you think this in rational terms and scientific terms, virtually all scientists will believe that there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. That is almost a given within astronomy and within science in general. So the only question then is, have any of those intelligent species uh, actually visited the Earth or not? That is a different question entirely, and we don't have any direct proof for that. <clears throat> we have indirect proof through megaliths, if you want to interpret megaliths in that fashion, but we have no direct proof, uh, which is unfortunate, but not necessarily surprising, because if, if you had a non-interference policy from a alien species, then you would not find evidence because they would take all evidence away. Uh, I mean, the obvious evidence <clears throat> you could uh, give is on the you know the megalithic walls of the megalithic pyramids you could inscribe you know e equals mc squared or something mm. um you could inscribe one over 37 what no one over 137 that's all you need to write because that is the fine constant. It's, it's a, a measure within um, <clears throat> atomic physics. It's known as the fine constant. And it's, we presume the fine constant will be the same anywhere in the universe. It's, it's a ratio that appears within um, uh, subatomic particles and things of that nature and the different forces between those particles and gravity and various other things are, all have this constant of 1 over 37. 1 over 137. And so all you need to do is write 1 over 137 and everyone will know that you have been a highly technical species because, I mean, who knows of the fine constant? Not many people. Uh, it wasn't discovered uh, in the modern era, probably, I think, until about the mid-20th century or something of that nature. I'll have to look it up when that was found. Anyway, anyone can look it up. I'm sure it's on wiki somewhere. 
Um, so yeah, evidence would be easy to leave if a species wanted to do so, uh, but they haven't. And so all we have is these strange anomalies, which we call the megalithic era. And now we have these strange anomalies, which indicate a high degree of mathematical ability and a high degree of cart cartographical ability and a high degree of astronomical knowledge in terms of the um, movements of the solar system and the earth and whatever, you know, precession, obliquity, all of those sort of things, and the form and shape of the earth, all of those sort of things. Hmm. But we have an idea that people knew about this back in the ancient times because, uh, I mean, for instance, we have, we've talked about this before, but we have the Hamat Zodiac, hmm. um, which it might be worth bringing up again if people have forgotten what the Hamat Zodiac looks like. Um, so yeah, here's a detailed one and there's a, okay, that there's two images. So if I bring up those images, oh, why didn't they come up together? Um, <clears throat> okay. I'll have to do this twice because they're not in the same page. But if I do a share screen on this and do this one first. This is the Hamat Zodiac on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. Now, this is 2000 years old and it's a Jewish Zodiac. We've talked about this before and it was owned by Jesus, Jesus of Gamala. And Josephus Flavius was sent to destroy it because it had heretical images of animals. And as you can see, it's got lots of animals on it. But in the middle, very incongruously for a Jewish zodiac, and this is a Jewish zodiac, it's in a synagogue. Um, it has an image of Helios, the sun god, holding a blue green earth in his gravitational grasp. And so if I knock that off and go to another screen, which is just a slightly better image. And so now we can see Helios in more detail. And we can see that Helios is holding a blue green spherical earth in his gravitational grasp. Yeah, and we that, know that this is a sphere. Ralph, isn't it? It's unmistakable. It's unmistakable. We yeah. know it's a sphere because the lines of latitude and longitude that are drawn upon it are curved. And if they're curved, this has to be a sphere. It's not a it's not a disc in his hand, it's a sphere in his hand. And also, if you look very cleverly around the outside, um, it's darker on this side. They've put black lines on the right side, the upper right side, and white lines on the lower left side. Again, you would only get that from a sphere. A sphere is lit from one side. It will be whiter on one side and darker on the other side. That's exactly what this is. And it's got curved lines of latitude and longitude on it. It's a sphere. And Helios the sun is holding a blue-green spherical earth in his gravitational grasp. It means that the heliocentric model of the uh, solar system was well known uh, in this era on the shores of the Sea of Galilee in a Jewish synagogue owned by Jesus, Jesus of Gamala. And remember this Jesus of Gamala Sophias guy was the rebel commander of 600 rebel fishermen. Who was the commander of rebel fishermen in the first century AD? We're talking biblical. Um, but that is the sort of knowledge that was known about 2000 years ago. 
So what knowledge did they have back in the Neolithic? Uh, well, let's, let's not call it Neolithic. What knowledge did they have back in the megalithic era? Did they also understand this, you know, that the earth yeah. was a blue green sphere with lines of latitude and longitude on it? Um, the evidence from Avebury would suggest they do. And the evidence from the Great Pyramid, if you understand the Great Pyramid uh, map of the world, indicates that they did. Yes. So there was a very early knowledge of the form and shape of the earth. We have the information that sort of confirms that. So although this is very esoteric, um, and many people will not be able to comprehend it, because it's outside their sphere of knowledge and expectations, it does make sense. And as I say in my book, a child of six will see uh, this evidence better than an adult within academia, mm. because they won't be indoctrinated in, into all of the structures of um, contemporary history that we have. And they will be able to see the immediate uh, similarity with the form and shape of the earth. Mm. So there we go. So that's what I wrote about back in 96, whenever it was, 1996. Mm. Um, and it remains a, a largely unknown uh, and disregarded book, I have to say. A lot of that is because I didn't promote it very much because I went on to all of my um, New Testament and Old Testament work, which this conflicted with, you know, if I wanted to keep the Old Testament work uh, semi academic and serious, then it didn't want contaminating with this highly esoteric explanations for yeah. Avebury, Stonehenge and, and Giza. And so uh, for many years, I didn't promote it very much. And so it became a very specialist book amongst uh, a few people who understood it. Um, but I think it deserves more being more widely read, I think, now. I think so. I mean, it gives real answers to these problems that have existed for thousands of years. So it does. I, uh, I really do think it should be um, promoted again, definitely. Yeah. Um, just uh, drawing this to a conclusion then, Ralph, um, can we say that these uh, these ancient monuments were constructed partly to galvanize and accelerate human progress? Yes. Well, that was my contention. Um, if you go down the von Daniken uh, theory, if you go down the Hancock theory, then they had ancient knowledge and they lost that knowledge. And that's why we went into a very long dark age. Uh, if you go down the von Daniken route of an alien intervention, or even if you go down into the 2001 A Space Odyssey uh, route, which outlined the same theory. In fact, the whole of the, because 2001 A Space Odyssey was rather Masonic. It, it, it embodies what, uh, quite a few people within masonry think um, that there was uh, an alien intervention and they came down and they gave education. Now in 2001, A Space Odyssey, that was very basic education in how to learn to fend for yourself and how to kill animals and therefore get more protein. And that's all they did. But if you looked at that in more rational terms, well, not rational. It, if you made that into a later era when there were hominids running around and you had a 2001 a Space Odyssey um, visitation when there were already hominids, you know, Homo sapiens running around, um, and you gave them some education, um in order to bring about civilization well how would you do that well you would need an education process and what better way to educate a particular um tribe or group of hominids than to create a pyramid or to create a henge 
or to create a huge great wall over in Central America somewhere. Um, the many other places that you find uh, megaliths around the world. What you have in a uh, construction project of that nature is everything you would need to create a civilization. You would need a settled farming society to provide enough protein for the people to actually work and have some spare people around uh, to do all of the other work, which you couldn't do with a hunter-gatherer society. So you'd need a farming community. You would need um, an administration. You would need a, perhaps a kingship or something. And you'd need an artisan class who could actually do the designs and well, the designs will probably be given to you, but to uh, man the quarries and cut the rocks and actually put them into place. So you'd need a, a workforce and all that workforce would need to be fed. And then you would need a, um, a mariner class because in all of these projects, pretty much, someone had to come along with a ship to move the stones. So you would need a class of sailors. And everything you need in the sort of modern world, you, plus you would need a priestly class. You need priests to actually man these temples and monitor the cosmos because all of these ancient religions were Sabean. They were stellar religions observing the cosmos. So you'd need a priestly class as well. So everything you need for a, a relatively sort of modern looking civilization would be brought about by a large construction project. Whether that was making uh, henges in Britain or whether it was making pyramids in Egypt or whether it was making whatever they were doing in South America. Um, you could evolve and hopefully perpetuate a civilization through this construction project. And that's the difficult bit. That's why you need more than one project because if you do 12 projects around the world you can guarantee that six of them will not su succeed and so you need more than one project you need a dozen of these projects uh, and hopefully the difficult bit is that you not only create a civilization that can make these uh, megalithic monuments using obviously machinery from the visitation so using technical uh, capabilities that we don't have um, at the present time but using those uh, technical artifacts whatever they had to construct these great monuments but then you need to be able to pass this information on down through uh, the millennia down through the generations and that's the difficult bit because you only need one a uh, lazy generation that doesn't want to do the right thing, that wants to interrupt history and heritage um, and do their own thing. And you could lose all that information within one generation. Mm -hmm. So civilization is always a very <clears throat> difficult thing to maintain. It's, it's very fragile. And we've seen the number of civilizations that have come and gone <clears throat> simply because they could not maintain it into, not necessarily even because they were defeated by another civilization, just because they couldn't manage to keep their civilization going, their education system, their religious system, their um, aristocratic royal system. They couldn't keep it going. And so Egypt collapsed and Rome collapsed. Um, the Greek, you know, civilization collapsed. All of these civilizations have come and gone. And luckily, we've managed to keep on some small aspects of these civilizations. So we've managed to perpetuate it into the future. But they were so close to losing all of that information. You've only got to lose it for a couple of centuries and it's gone. You know, pyramid or no pyramid. <clears throat> Obviously, the pyramids were designed to last for millennia, mm. which is a strong inference um, that if you do have an intervention, it is very difficult for these people to come back again because the pyramids and the megaliths were designed to last for thousands of years. 
So <clears throat> any future visitation would obviously be thousands of years in the future. Mm. Otherwise, you could do it on, on paper. <laughs> you could do it on papyrus mm -hmm. and have all the information there if mm. you were going to come back every century. But no, it was done in megaliths designed to last for not just millennia, but tens of millennia. And the dating system they used was not the annual um, movement of the constellations. It was the processional movement of the constellations, which is 26,000 years. Again, we're using a millennial calendar. And the obliquity calendar is 40,000 years. So again, we're using a calendar that runs over tens of millennia. And so we know that if there was any sort of visitation, that it would be very difficult for these people to come back again. Hmm. And they would have to come back maybe um, in terms of procession uh, at the half cycle. So the full cycle is the great year, which is 26,000 years, roughly 25,600, I think it is. Uh, let's call it 26,000 years for cash. Um, so you'd either come back at the half cycle, which is 13,000 years, or the next full cycle, which would be 26,000 years. Um, so the half cycle will be the end of the... Um, I'm trying to think which constellation. Is it the end of uh, Aquarius or is it the end of Pisces? Anyway, uh, well, you can look it up yeah. on a... Uh, I was going to say, we're, we're, on... we're leaving Pisces now and entering Aquarius, aren't we, in the next few Yeah, years? in 2350, uh, mm -hmm. I make it. So we've got another 330 years to go, something like that, uh, is the change between uh, Pisces and Aquarius. So I think that would be the half cycle. Um, you can look it up on a, a, a Zodiac. Uh, just look from the beginning of uh, Leo and mm. count round six. And I think you come to the end of Pisces. So if that was the case, uh, you'd be talking about a, a second coming uh, in 350 years. If it's the next zodiac, um, then it would be another 2,000 years after that. Um, if it was the full cycle, then nobody would be coming back for another 13 and a half thousand years. Mm. So you'd have to a long time to wait. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but it might be an indication that space travel is difficult. You know, people. Specula speculate about wormholes and faster than light travel and all of this sort of nice speculation and it's great for Star Trek, but maybe it's not true. Maybe the laws of physics hold that we know of. And if they hold, then that makes travel across the universe, universe very, very difficult. Even travel across um, the galaxy, very diff difficult. I mean, remember the <clears throat> the galaxy is 100,000 light years across. So even if you could go at half the speed of light, it would still take you 200,000 years to go across the galaxy. That's a long time. Mm. Um, so even within our local group uh, of stars in, in, in our galaxy, it's going to take you thousands of years to go between star and star. Mm. And so... Well, that's a problem. Um, what do you do? Do you have hibernation? Do you have uh, robots that will do it for you? And it's all done by robots. You'd want to take uh, a few books and board games with you, wouldn't you? <laughs> I think you would. <laughs> yeah. Um, it would make it very difficult if the laws of physics are as we know them today. How on earth do you do it? How do you have these expeditions, you know, going out across... Mm -hmm the uh the galaxy so just a hypothetical question for you here ralph so um if we go down the uh von Deineken route with all this um and if we suppose that the the builders the designers of these monuments have been watching us since uh they were constructed what do you think they would make of our progress so far <laughs> yes um 
there was a famous quote about that, wasn't there? I think on a comedy show. What do you think of it so far? <laughs> Rubbish. Yeah. Um, I forget which one that was. There was a comedy. It, it was a was it the Muppets, the two old guys up in the balcony. Oh yes, it was the Muppets. What do you think of it so far? It's right. Yeah, no. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what might, they might say, I think. <laughs> when, not worth bothering with yet, you know. Well, I, I was, I was, yeah, I was wondering because um, they also say that power corrupts. So maybe that is the great problem with humanity is that, you know, we, we might set off with good intentions, but at some stage, power corrupts mm. and it all goes um, pear shaped, so to speak. Yeah, well, we've had our moments. Um, we've obviously done fairly well on a technical basis, but um, yeah, would they be impressed with our civilization? Probably not. Um, the interesting thing, though, to speculate, if you want to speculate along these lines, is what would you do as a technical civilization going to a, a new star? So say it's us. We now have the technical capability of going to Alpha Centauri or, you know, one of our local group and we can actually fly across there. What would we do when we got there if we found a hominid species running around um, half starving because they didn't know how to survive on their planet sort of thing? What would we do as a species? Um, <clears throat> well, we might help them. We might give them an education. Um, we might help them to form a civilization so they have a better chance of survival and a better chance of technical progress. We might do that. We might have uh, a non-interference policy so that we don't leave any evidence of our visitation in order not to influence them too much in their further development so you don't leave any direct evidence that you've ever been there but if i was doing that i might do all of that so you might make pyramids or whatever it is and henges or whatever um but i would be interested in their progress as you were saying <clears throat> so how do you do that well you would leave some sort of sensors you would leave a camera and then the problem becomes is is how do you how interested are you where would you leave the camera where would you leave the sensor um are you that interested so do you leave one you know on a mountain overlooking a valley yeah maybe not in in 2001 a space odyssey they were completely disinterested and so they didn't really care if man survived or whether they died. Didn't care whatsoever. The only thing they cared about was, did mankind become a spacefaring civilization? Um, and so in 2001, A Space Odyssey, the camera, as it were, was left on the moon with a big magnetic anomaly so you could easily find it. Mm but it was left on the dark side of the moon so well there is no dark side that's a stupid phrase that has come into uh, popular terms there is no dark side of the moon it, it rotates the same as we do um far side is the better mm. better word for it so um they they left a a monolith on the far side of the moon um, with a big magnetic signature so you could easily find it. But only a space-faring civilization could find it. So they had no interest in us whatsoever unless we had got to the moon and had populated the moon or at least surveyed the whole of the moon. That was all they were interested in. Um, and that might be true as well. If you are running around the galaxy and you've only ever found uh, one hominid type, you know, intelligent um, being, then you might be more interested in them. So you might take more interest in their development, perhaps. But if there are thousands of them knocking around all over the place within the galaxy, well, you're not going to be very interested at all. Oh. Here's another planet with some stupid quadrupeds, you know, crawling around it. Uh, well, we don't really care much about them. 
but maybe we might be interested if if they finally get round to space travel then we might be interested so we'll leave a telephone as it were you know in inverted commas a telephone on the moon which is effectively what happened on 2001 a space odyssey as soon as they uncovered the monolith it phoned home mm. and said hey look civilization has arrived on this particular planet yeah you might do that you might do that and and so there might be no um sensors detecting what we are doing at the present time until we reach a certain stage of development like going to the moon like going to mars or one of the moons of jupiter or something you know and and then they might take an interest and say oh well, this sort of nearly worth talking to if you know if they can go to jupiter then they're nearly worth talking to <laughs> um you know it's interesting to speculate but you know mm. if that's what we would do if we found a species on another planet then maybe that's what other species might do uh if they uh came to earth but one thing we can be very sure of is if there is a intelligent species uh, that knows about us, they would not come 5,000 light years across the galaxy to cut some pretty patterns in a farmer's field. That is not what you would do. <laughs> <laughs> Having expended all that energy getting across the galaxy, you're not going to play silly buggers in farmers well field. we could get into the subject of crop circles there are some <laughs> incredibly impressive oh yes uh, crop circles that have been made and i i find it uh, you know very difficult to believe that there were just but, four or five blokes with you know machines but we, we, we know who who do do them they, they've admitted their work so <clears throat> I must they, they, they do it with gps and um uh with with surveyors you know the, theodolites i mean it's not too too difficult really oh okay um oh, yeah. but they did admit to it and they they showed they showed people how it was done <clears throat> and and they do it with like garden rollers and things of this nature so you crush the uh, the crops down um so but anyway you would not go across the galaxy to make right. pretty patterns in a farmer's field that's mm -hmm. just not what would happen and i don't think you would go across the galaxy to play silly buggers with people in f-16s either uh, again i don't think that's what you would do it's certainly not what i would do if i went to alpha centauri and found a nice little planet circling alpha centauri i'm not going to sit there buzzing um you know world war ii piston en engined aircraft you know just because they happen to be there uh you would come and announce your presence yes. if you thought the civilization had come to a, a point where you think they're worth talking to you would announce your presence yeah. um so i don't think we're being uh talked to at the present stage i think that is just the military complex and the political complex keeping this in the public eye because some people want to promote this like von daniken did um and therefore it's useful to have people believing in the possibility and therefore keep it in the public eye in the newspapers you say oh this you know this aircraft was buzzed by a ufo um yeah that keeps it in the public eye so people will know about it because pe some people might know that this is a possibility because they might understand the historical possibilities that have been uncovered. Um, you could also speculate that some people have better evidence than we do. You know, if, if an artifact was left uh, from that time of the me megalithic era, uh, you know, some complex little technical artifact was left if that complex little artifact is still in the possession of someone, then you would have evidence for a initiatory society, like a Templar-like or a Masonic type or a Jesus type um, initiatory society, because you know the, 
Church of Jesus and James was a Masonic type institution that had secrets like that Zodiac, which they didn't show to everybody. Um, let's show it again so people can see the secrets that they had. These are the secrets that these um, institutions had back in this era, back in the uh, first century AD. They understood the heliocentric model of the solar system. They understood the form and shape of the earth, latitudes and longitudes. All of that was understood by the Church of Jesus and James. Um, but that information was not given out to the laity. That was not given out to the general population. That was within a select few within their society. Um, so who knows what other information they might have had at that time yeah. or what artifacts they might have been in possession of um, at that time and now in the modern era. And so, of course, you could easily convince someone of an ancient visitation if you had some little technical artifact which nobody could explain was obviously not uh, from our technology um, and so you could easily keep a an aristocrat aristocratic clique at the top of society because they would have they would have seen this artifact and they would have understood the implications and they would know to keep it secret within their little society um, because of the power it gives over people if you had this knowledge mm. and these you know capabilities whatever this artifact would do then of course you would have people at the top who understood that there had been an ancient visitation all complete speculation, of course, because we have no evidence of that. But yeah. uh, what would you do if you visited um, uh, an, an, another planet that had, you know, hominids on it? If you had a non-interference policy, would you delete all evidence of your visit? Or would you leave one small little artifact because the trouble is, if you've created a society, you've, you've created a civilization, you want that civilization to perpetuate itself. You want um, it to last through the millennia. So you need to give the uh, administration, the aristocracy, the priesthood or the royalty, you need to give them perhaps something that will keep them special and powerful so they can maintain that society down through the millennia. So perhaps if you gave them a little token that was obviously very different and difficult to explain, would that help the society survive? Because it would give them power so they could maintain their positions? It's a possibility. I think it's a... a a fascinating theory <laughs> <laughs> what sort of token what sort of token would you give you know which is not too powerful you don't want to give something that's powerful that can be used as a weapon mm. uh because that's open to demagogues and you know mm. ultimate power corrupts ultimately so yeah. it couldn't be a weapon it would have to be something small um decorative maybe uh obviously not of this world as it were something that had been given by the gods because some, these people some form of technology some form of technology yeah, but, but what explained. sort of technology it wouldn't have to be too powerful otherwise it could be misused um but it could be something like a you know uh, like a television hmm. fairly innocuous hmm. but obviously obviously not of this world if you had a, a a viewing device um if you had i i don't know there's many little artifacts you could leave as a token um which could be would have to last for thousands of years so it'd have to be very durable you would have to be capable of being misused on on occasions uh so it'd have to be robust um you know i don't know there's many things you could leave um <clears throat> something for cutting stones you know uh, 
a sort of lightsaber for cutting stones or something mm. but that could be used as a weapon so that might not be a good idea this conversation could continue for several days ralph <laughs> um I feel, like, I feel like it's just warming up it's getting really good um <laughs> but we're over the three hour mark now so we probably oh yes so we are so um thank you so much for your time most important thing is that people read Thoth and K2 as well. It's mm. uh, just outstanding books. So where is the best place for the viewers to find Thoth and K2? Yeah, probably on Amazon again, um, simply because it's convenient. I don't have to hold uh, stocks of books. Um, so it's um, Thoth, Architect of the Universe, and it's a K2 Quest of the Gods. Um, and it's written by Ralph with an F. So it's slightly different to uh, my usual spelling, which has kept it separate from all of my books, uh, all my other books, very, very neatly, actually, because if you do a search, it doesn't come up with the R-A-L-F -R name mm. at all. Mm. <clears throat> so anyway, um, Amazon, Amazon is the best. There's um, paperbacks and there is obviously a iPad version or a Kindle version, whatever you have. Um, and I've got a few videos. I think I've put out a few videos on my site as well that have got some images on it um, <clears throat> on my YouTube site, um, yeah. which is, uh, I don't know how you find I think it's just Ralph Ellis, I think. Yeah, YouTube, if, Ralph if you Ellis. search on YouTube for Ralph Ellis, you come up to second or third video. Yeah. So easy to yeah, find. People can find that. Okay. So yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, esoteric, as I say, I cannot vouch for its... Uh, authenticity is just the information um i give you the information and you can make up your own mm -hmm. minds you know i really don't care if you believe it or don't believe it but it's interesting information uh which may get more proof in the future we don't know you know if uh, the more archaeology that do we do the more is uh, exposed and so it, it might gain traction in later years we don't know but it's an interesting book. Well, it certainly should do. Um, I didn't even ask you about um, Joseph of Arimathea coming to this country, possibly with the sacred measurements of Thoth and mm. King Arthur's Round Table. You did some work on Newgrange as well. Yes. In the book. So there's probably still other stuff we can uh, touch upon at a later date. But um, yeah, yeah, there's uh, lots of stuff, playing cards, yeah. metrology, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Karnak, Karnak as well in, in uh, yeah. Northern France is a very interesting site. Um, yeah, so thanks so much, Ralph, for today. My head's spinning now, so thanks for that. It's uh, <laughs> some amazing stuff, particularly towards the end. It really is uh, thought-provoking, this subject matter. Um, and I can't wait to read K2. So, yes. Yeah, so thank you so much. Please like, share and subscribe and we'll be back again in the near future. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Pleasure, Ralph.